Chapter 18 of Women's Suffrage and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matea Bracic. Women's Suffrage and Politics The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuller. The Fighting Forces. In the struggle from which the final woman suffrage victory was now about to emerge, four groups of fighting forces were engaged. They were the suffragists, the liquor interests, the anti-suffragists, and the prohibitionists. In the suffrage army there were over two million women enlisted. The parent body, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, directed the activities of the great mass of them, while the Woman's Party projected its entirely separate and often conflicting program for the group of militants. When victory finally perched upon the banners of the suffragists, the National Suffrage Association had direct auxiliaries in 46 states of the Union, and these far-reaching confederated bodies were functioning as one organ through its centralized national board. Extensive headquarters were maintained in both Washington and New York. In Washington, congressional activities radiated from the Great House at 1626 Rhode Island Avenue. In New York, headquarters occupied two entire floors, equivalent to 30 large rooms, of a business building on Madison Avenue. Between 40 and 50 women were continuously retained on the clerical staff, and as many field workers were engaged in campaigns. A publishing company prepared and printed literature of various kinds. Publicity, organization, data, and educational departments constituted branches of the general administration, and a weekly 32-page magazine, The Woman Citizen, was maintained as the association's official organ and mouthpiece. Historically, the National American Woman Suffrage Association presents a record of intensive organization probably never paralleled. Through half a century of incessant work, that record reaches back to 1869. Even 15 years before that time, suffrage work of an agitational kind had been conducted by local committees or clubs under the direction of a strongly centralized national board. That plan of organization served the purposes of the early time admirably, but when it became clear that the women must for a time go to the states to seek and win their suffrage by referenda campaigns, a different form of organization was found necessary. The workers, therefore, by common consent in 1869, prepared the way for a new body better adapted to the new phase of the struggle. Out of the process, two organizations emerged, the National Woman Suffrage Association and the American Woman Suffrage Association, the first led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, the second by Lucy Stone, the differences being more personal than tactical. The aims of both were the same to secure suffrage for women whenever possible and by any constitutional method. The National emphasized the federal suffrage method by holding annual conventions in Washington and securing hearings on the federal suffrage amendment. But it maintained, too, the policy of winning woman suffrage state by state until enough states should have adopted it to make women voters an element no longer negligible in the constituencies of United States congressmen who would some day vote on the federal suffrage amendment. The American concentrated on state campaigns with the same end in view, whenever federal action should be possible. The field was wide, and by tacit consent the two organizations kept out of each other's way, only a few states having auxiliaries to both. Twenty years later, the younger recruits, perceiving that the two separate organizations at times conflicted, set themselves to the task of union. This they successfully accomplished in 1890, the National American Woman Suffrage Association resulting with this announced aim. The object of this association shall be to secure protection in their right to vote to the women citizens of the United States by appropriate national and state legislation. Auxiliary to this national body were the state suffrage organizations, known by various titles. They paid dues and sent delegates to the annual conventions where officers were elected, reports heard, and plans made. 
The annual conventions were dated from 1869, although they had been held continuously since 1850, except during the war period. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, whose state papers, as Miss Anthony called them, showed a rarer touch of the statesman's genius than those of any other woman have ever shown, was president of the National Association continuously from 1869 to 1890, and although approaching her 80th year, served the merge associations for one more year. The National American Woman Suffrage Association had but four presidents, Mrs. Stanton being the first. She was followed in 1891 by Susan B. Anthony, who retired in 1900 at the age of 80, having been the suffrage president only nine years, but the propulsive force of suffrage, as Grace Greenwood called her, for 40 years, the untiring, intrepid, never discouraged, never defeated, greatest souled woman of the suffrage movement. Carrie Chapman Catt was president from 1900 to 1904. In 1904, there came to the presidency one who stood unchallenged throughout her career as the greatest orator among women the world has ever known, and who made more converts to the suffrage cause than any other one person, Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, vice president from 1891 to 1904 and president from 1904 to 1915. Carrie Chapman Catt served again as president from 1915 to 1920 when the final victory came. Lucy Stone, the leader of the American, was made chairman of the executive committee at the union of the two suffrage organizations in 1890, and after her death in 1893, her place in the movement was ably assumed by her husband, Henry B. Blackwell, and her daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell. After 1890, the Composite Organization, with its auxiliaries, conducted all the referenda suffrage campaigns in the United States, while at the same time carrying on the campaign for a federal suffrage amendment. An occasional independent society arose here and there, sometimes with special aims, sometimes motivated by personalities, but these were spasmodic and short-lived. With a single exception, no one of them ever conducted a campaign. The exception was the Congressional Union, organized in 1913 and in 1916 renamed the Woman's Party. Its sole aim was the passage of the Federal Suffrage Amendment. Its tactics, being out of harmony with those of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, auxiliaryship was denied it. It therefore conducted a parallel but independent federal campaign. The early administration work of the National American Woman Suffrage Association was performed in the homes of the officers until 1895, when a part of one room in the World Building, New York City, served as headquarters for the organization committee. That same year, an attempt was made to establish a headquarters in Philadelphia as well as in New York, but at the end of the first year, the two headquarters were united and located in two rooms in the World Building in New York. In 1898, the headquarters were moved to the Tract Society building, where they occupied four rooms. In 1902, they were removed to Warren, Ohio. In 1909, they were returned to New York and occupied considerable space in a business building on Fifth Avenue. Before the end of the suffrage campaign, headquarters meant the extensive housing arrangements already noted as applying to New York and Washington. Concurrent with other suffrage work, the organization sponsored a series of suffrage papers that formed a journalistic chain reaching forward from the beginning in 1869 to the end in 1920. As early as 1868, Miss Anthony and Mrs. Stanton launched a lively paper called The Revolution. It lasted until 1870. In 1870, Lucy Stone, with money left her by Mrs. Elizabeth Eddy, established the Woman's Journal. It was published weekly in Boston and served as the organ for the American Association until the merger in 1890, when it became the official organ of the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Thereafter, it had a continuous life until 1917. Mrs. Frank Leslie, having in the meantime bequeathed the fund to be used for the furtherance of the suffrage cause, that year, 1917, out of a combination of the Woman's Journal and several smaller suffrage papers, the Woman Citizen was established 
in the hope, as its prospectus announced, that it might prove a self-perpetuating memorial to Mrs. Frank Leslie's generosity to the cause of woman suffrage and her faith in woman's irresistible progress. It remained the official organ of the association until the victory of 1920, since which time it has functioned as an independent magazine devoted to the civic interests of women. The activities of the second group of the fighting forces in the suffrage struggle, i.e. the liquor interests, have been already fairly covered. When the federal investigation into the political activities of the brewers brought out the minutes of the conferences where political campaigns were reported, it was discovered that the liquor interests political committees heavily financed had directed all campaigns in the nation and that women's suffrage was uniformly included with temperance activities as equally invidious to the liquor traffic. These revelations made clear many a mystifying incident and squared with suffrage experiences that had been carefully filed away after each campaign. That the liquor forces regarded themselves as solely responsible for anti-suffrage campaigns was evident, since each member of liquor organizations, when reporting suffrage defeats in his state, said, we did it. In the closing years of the struggle, the trade added allied interests and groups of foreign-born voters as among those who did it, but all were under the direction of the common master. The liquor organizations were the United States Brewers Association, the Wholesale Distillers Association, and the Retail Dealers Association, each with its auxiliary in each state. Collectively, these organizations and their allies were designated as the WETs. The only other organized opposition to suffrage came from the group of women commonly called the Antis. The name of their organization was the Association Opposed to Suffrage for Women. Its members were mainly well-to-do, carefully protected, and entertained the feeling of distrust of the people usual in their economic class. Their speeches indicated at times an anxious disturbance of mind, lest the privileges they enjoyed might be lost in the rights to be gained. The first anti-organization appeared in Boston sometime before 1890 and was lengthily designated as the association opposed to the further extension of suffrage to women. It began its work by sending a male lawyer to protest in its name against having the vote thrust upon women, and it issued a small sheet called the Remonstrance, which withheld the names of editor and publisher. With the years, these ladies grew bolder and made their own protests before committees. By and by, similar groups were organized in other eastern cities, but the Protestants gained no headway west of Ohio. Their uniform arguments were that the majority of women did not want the vote, therefore none should have it, that woman's place was in the home, and that women were incompetent to vote. After 1912, the women antis were represented in all referenda campaigns, but the manager of their activities was a paid outsider. A few names of women within the state were usually secured, and these women were made to do duty as officers of anti-suffrage association for the state, but they were rarely workers. Speakers were kept in the field and were sent collectively into campaign states. Suffragists learned to regard them paradoxically as unfriendly aides. Parlor meetings were their specialty, and they frequently drew an audience of conservative women who could not have been persuaded to attend a suffrage meeting, and these women often received an impulse there which led them into the suffrage campaign. The antis recruited from the indifferent, and through an aroused interest many of the indifferent became suffragists. The president of the National Suffrage Association at one time was entertained at luncheon in a conservative city where the table conversation developed the interesting fact that every guest present had been converted to woman suffrage in anti-meetings. In another city, a woman became so indignant at what she heard at such a parlor meeting that she presented $10,000 to the Suffrage Association, the largest contribution any living person had made at that date. The only time and place when the women antis really aroused suffrage tempers was in legislative hearings. Legislative committees divided the time equally between suffragists and anti-suffragists, and thus the appearance was given of a conflict between two groups of women, each presenting equal claims, before men who had the authority to act as judges. 
The suffragists represented an unmistakable popular demand for a just cause facing an inevitable final triumph, and the poorest of their speeches no man could answer. Yet when an anti with an ingratiating smile said, Gentlemen, we trust you to take care of us and the government, almost any legislative committee could be counted on to beam with self-satisfaction in response. Then it was that suffragists felt, as at no other time, the poignant difference between the appeal of a just claim and the clinging vine. However, even this experience stirred a new suffrage zeal, so was not without its uses. Whatever value women anti-suffragists may place upon their efforts in campaigns, neither their opponents, the organized suffragists, nor their unacknowledged allies, the liquor forces, as evidenced in the secret minutes, credited them with decisive influence. A letter, already quoted in part, is illustrated of the attitude of the liquor forces on the subject. Wrote Hugh Fox, Secretary of the United States Brewers Association, to the Fred Miller Brewing Company. We are in a position to establish channels of communication with the leaders of the anti-suffrage movement for our friends in any state where suffrage is an issue. To those who erroneously thought of the anti-suffrage women as the leaders of the anti-suffrage movement, this seemed conclusive proof of collusion, but the next sentence absolved the anti-women and threw this telling light on the situation. I am under the impression that a new anti-suffrage association has been organized in Illinois and is a retail liquor dealer's affair. It is clear that Mr. Fox had no thought of the women antis at all, but pointed his correspondent to the only force he recognized as anti-suffragists. As a matter of fact, there had been no organized women antis in Illinois for years. Probably the worst damage that the women antis did was to give unscrupulous politicians a respectable excuse for opposing suffrage, and to confuse public thinking by standing conspicuously in the limelight while a potent enemy worked in darkness. The anti-suffragists were probably as neutral toward the Prohibition versus liquor campaign as were the suffragists, but there was this difference. The women antis and the liquor men worked for a common aim. The suffragists and the prohibitionists had two entirely different aims. The campaigns of the anti-women and the liquor men supplemented each other. The campaigns of the prohibitionists and suffragists were often in conflict, and each regarded the other in those instances as a decided handicap. Very many persons accused the women antis and liquor opponents of collusion. Suffrage field workers had the habit of sending affidavits in support of such a contention to headquarters. In the closing years, well-known counsel for the liquor forces appeared at hearings in several states with the anti-women, and not only spoke for, but sat with them and wore their red rose insignia. A representative of the anti-suffrage association sent to Montana in 1914, attempting to arrange a basis of cooperation with the Montana liquor men, whereby the women would do the public work and the liquor men kept out of sight. The National Forum, liquor organ at Butte, published the whole story. The Liberal Advocate, official organ of the Ohio Liquor League, published at Columbus, ran a series of articles by the secretary of the Cincinnati Association opposed to woman suffrage, and many liquor papers carry general material sent out by the women anti-suffragists. Streetcars in Stark County, Ohio, 1914, carried advertisements for the liquor amendment which urged the reader to see the card on the opposite side of the car. On the opposite side was the women's anti-suffrage advertisement, asking for votes against the suffrage amendment. In Warren, Ohio, pieces of literature issued by the women antis and literature issued by the liquor organization folded in the same package were left at the doors of all houses by professional bill distributors. In Nebraska, the conspicuous right-hand man of the women antis was the well-known publicity agent for the brewers. The Macon County, Michigan Retail Liquor Dealers Association addressed the following letter to newspapers, one of which turned the copy over to suffrage headquarters. Macon County Retail Liquor Dealers Association, Office of the Secretary, Mount Clemens, Michigan, March 31, 1913. To the Publisher I enclose herewith copy of an advertisement which I wish you would insert in this week's issue of your paper.
I will thank you to see that this is done, and mail statement of charges and also mark copy to me, and we will remit for the same. Joseph Matthews, Secretary. Enclosure. The enclosure, for the publication of which Maycomb County Retail Liquor Dealers Association guaranteed payment, read, An appeal to men. You should vote against woman suffrage for 10,000 reasons. We mention but six. As women, we do not want the strife, bitterness, falsification, and publicity which accompany political campaigns. We women are not suffering at the hands of our fathers, husbands, and brothers because they protect us in our homes. We have women's greatest right to be free from political medley. We do not want to lose this freedom. We have refrained from protest heretofore, depending upon men to protect women from the ballot. We now ask the men of Michigan to defend us and vote no on suffrage. Keep mother, wife, and sister in the protected home. Do not force us into partisan politics. Put a cross before the word no on April 7th and win our gratitude. The appeal was issued by the Michigan Association opposed to woman suffrage and signed by its women officers. In many states, posters or placards issued by the women antis were hung both outside and inside saloons. Usually they were hastily removed when photographers appeared, yet photographs were taken and are on file. To hints in the press that their association was supported by liquor money, anti-suffrage women made loud disclaimers, as did also the liquor men. Certainly there was no need for anti-suffrage women to go outside their own group for funds, for most of their leaders were among the wealthiest of American women. One interesting affidavit filed at National Headquarters was that of Frances Belford Wayne, a clever, well-known newspaper writer of Denver. A Mr. Mailing of Denver, long the anti's chief field man, tried to persuade her, as he had other Colorado women, to engage in the service of the antis. If only you would drop your silly convictions and look after number one, I could take you down to these anti-suffragists and put you in a position to make as much money in six months as you can make here in two years. You could have a trip to Europe, live on velvet, and line your pockets merely by boosting against suffrage instead of boosting for it. Better let me lead you to the trough was Mr. Mailing's final word. The Women's Journal, October 31, 1914 Although the Antis were able to finance themselves and seemed to be well supplied with campaign funds, and although the officers and members of the organization probably knew of no collusion, suffragists believed that a trail led from the women's organization into the liquor camp and that it was traveled by the men the women Antis employed. The anti-women usually sent a man and woman manager to each state, the man working among the men and the woman among the women. These men were observed in council with the liquor political managers too often to doubt that they laid their respective plans before each other so far as cooperation could be of advantage. One evidence of this understanding came in the last years when the Prohibition campaign was waxing exceedingly hot throughout the nation. By then, the liquor men were exerting their utmost strength to vote, not only all living sympathizers, but also names on tombstones in suffrage referenda. They had waged a deadly anti-suffrage campaign among labor men, but in response to the appeals of suffragists, the Federation of Labor and most labor unions had resolved for woman suffrage and labor leaders had long been sincere advocates of the cause. Union men were therefore engaged by the liquor interests to go among the local unions and by the reiterated declaration that women would vote prohibition and thus not only take away the working man's beer but also throw thousands out of employment, they succeeded in turning large numbers of organized labor men against suffrage. Even this additional force did not suffice for they apparently felt the need of still greater numbers. There followed an organized attempt to alienate from suffrage support a class less easy to reach, the men who were supposed to be supporting woman suffrage because they believed women voters would in turn support prohibition. To this task, the women anti set themselves with definite intent and great zeal. 
A pink leaflet entitled Women's Suffrage and the Liquor Question, Facts Show Women's Votes Have Not Aided Prohibition, was widely distributed by them in the 1915 campaigns and thereafter. At least one speaker at every meeting devoted time to this plan and tried to prove that women had not supported prohibition. At times, the speech got a bit misplaced, as at Plattsburgh, New York, where to a small audience, conspicuously sprinkled with well-known saloon men, an anti-discourse upon the positive disinclination of women voters to aid prohibition. At one and the same time, many trade papers were desperately entreating the liquor men to work early and late to defeat woman suffrage because women voters here and there and everywhere had voted dry. It behooves all saloon keepers and brewers to get busy early in the campaign to oppose the suffrage amendment by organized effort. It is the only way to save your business, urged the National Forum in the Montana campaign. The combined plans are best described by the political colloquialism catch em going and coming. Throughout the suffrage campaign, suffragists were constantly making accusation that votes were being bought and returns were being juggled. They did not, however, accuse the women antis even of possessing knowledge that these things were being done, yet the antis were continually diverting public attention from the guilty men to themselves, to the complete bewilderment of the public. Again and again, when suffragists attempted to tell the people what they knew and to announce some new evidence of the criminal nature of liquor opposition, the lady antis would rise to explain. Such public defense of the entire opposition was as exasperating to suffragists as it must have been gratifying to the liquor trade. This interpretation of the situation became so general that cartoonists found a fruitful theme in picturing ladies with widely spread skirts concealing the real anti-suffragists hiding behind. The last group in the fighting forces, the Prohibitionists, included the Prohibition Party and the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The Anti-Saloon League, nonpartisan and as strictly neutral on all other questions as the National American Women Suffrage Association, assumed and held the leadership of the fight for prohibition during the decade preceding the ratification of the Prohibition Amendment. The relation between this body and the organized suffragists was admirably stated by L. Ames Brown in the North American Review, Suffrage and Prohibition, 1916. Enmity against a common foe does not always result in an alliance between the two crusaders, but it cannot fail to produce a feeling of benevolent neutrality. Yet the woman suffrage struggle was vastly complicated by the prohibition struggle. Men indifferent to suffrage but hostile to prohibition were rendered impervious to the suffrage appeal, and men hostile to prohibition but in favor of suffrage were frightened by the continual insistence of liquor workers that women's suffrage meant the speedier coming of prohibition. Mr. Taft, ex-president, in a magazine article in 1915, was representative of the first class. It is said that women will vote for prohibition and that, therefore, if they are given the vote, we shall be rid of the saloon evils. To those of us who do not think that the saloon evil can be abolished by general prohibition, either national or statewide in states with large cities, and that the result of the effort would be worse than present conditions, this argument does not appeal. The lack of experience in affairs and the excess of emotion on the part of women in reaching their political decisions upon questions of this kind are what would lower the average practical sense and self-restraint of the electorate in case they were admitted to it now. Upon these two parallel reforms, each propelled onward by men and women whose souls were afire with a holy zeal, a vast part of the population at first looked indifferently. Eventually, all the intelligent members of society were listed for or against one or both. Had there been no prohibition movement in the United States, the women would have been enfranchised two generations before they were. Had that movement not won its victory, they would have struggled on for another generation. End of chapter 18「
or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org woman suffrage and politics the inner story of the suffrage movement by carrie chapman cat and nettie rogers schuler the decisive battle to even a casual observer at the close of nineteen sixteen it must have been clear that the long-continued strategy of the national american woman suffrage association in the forwarding of the suffrage cause was nearing its crucial test eleven states had been won to full suffrage and the argument that was bearing down with most force upon the passage of the federal suffrage amendment was the number of western women who were voting for the president of the united states and for members of the congress even those suffragists who belittled the state method of securing suffrage were proudly advertising the four million voting women of the west whose suffrage had been won by state referenda as the main reliance of their argument at washington for its own part from year to year and steadily the national suffrage association had used the political dynamite in the victories gained in the states as a means of blasting through to success at washington how many more states must be added to the full suffrage column before the congress of the united states would hear and be persuaded by that on march of destiny when the day comes that we have enough states we shall know it miss anthony had said with the year nineteen seventeen the day drew close and its recognition flushed the washington prospect rosily for suffrage workers on one state hung all their hopes for winding up referenda campaigns and compelling federal action by the congress that state was new york a suffrage referendum was scheduled there for november nineteen seventeen the second to be held in two years certain factors made the situation thrilling for one thing the campaign was in the far east instead of the far west for another in point of suffrage new york had become the most intensively organized state in the union then to new york is new york with more intricate problems of population and persuasions than any other state in the union a tremendous amount of suffrage history had been packed into the state from eighteen forty eight to eighteen seventy six it had been the recognized storm centre of the woman's rights movement even after it became clear that no ordinary demand would persuade the new york legislature to submit a suffrage amendment the suffrage organization kept its flag flying and sought such suffrage rights as the legislature could grant while asking continually for an amendment meanwhile the suffrage scene was shifted to the west and eastern suffragists began staking work and money and hopes upon that region time demonstrated that there was something wrong with the west it was not public opinion that continued to be liberal toward woman suffrage but suffrage victories came all too slowly western men suffragists gave their women political advice based upon their own experience in party contests this advice was to the effect that the majority of voters were favorable there being no known opposition and that a small campaign with a watch over the election and the count was sufficient no one seemed to know then that the sharpest political wits money could buy were surveying the field from secret watch-towers and reporting to their national chiefs that the federation of women's clubs was not interested that the woman's christian temperance union was absorbed in its own work that the suffrage organization was small and that the party managers had been seen with gratifying results don't arouse the ignorant and vicious classes advised the suffrage men apparently quite unaware that these classes were always aroused and mobilized when men unscrupulously intelligent and with sordid motives 
needed their aid under this advice one western campaign after another was defeated by and by eastern women lost faith in the investment of suffrage money and energy in the west at the same time many western women were persuaded that their failures might be due to resentment that in western campaigns eastern workers were on hand telling western people what to do in no western state where women were striving to gain submission of state suffrage amendments but failing to understand the nature of the inevitable contest to follow could they be persuaded to set themselves to the task of building up a suffrage organization big enough and strong enough to arouse public opinion to the point where it would overcome both blind traditional prejudice and wide awake if secretly directed opposition it was at this point that certain new york city women determined to produce an example of efficient suffrage organization and to prove its value if possible it was no easy stint the city was the home of the foreign-born containing as many irish as the city of dublin as many germans as the city of munich as many italians as the city of florence as many russians as riga as many austro-hungarians as prague as many norwegians as christiania and the sum total constituted a larger population than that of all the thirteen colonies when they arose in revolution against their mother country many city suffragists questioned the merits of the experiment to be tried upstate suffragists looked upon it with frank scepticism for was it not a well-established fact the reforms might sweep the state from buffalo to harlem bridge and inevitably be vanquished by the reactionaries and the vicious of the great city nevertheless from that moment new york state became again the storm centre of the movement and proved in the end the political lever with which the final moves were successfully made the year was nineteen o nine new york city as the suffragists that year came painfully to know is divided for government purposes into sixty-three assembly districts and these in turn into two thousand one hundred and twenty-seven election districts city maps in hand the few with the new idea laboriously classified the membership of all suffrage clubs and also the names upon the federal suffrage amendment petition that was then being circulated into assembly districts with a temporary suffrage leader in charge of each district in districts where no suffragists were known women envoys were sent to interview all kinds of people and in this way find suffragists through many private meetings the membership of the old order of clubs was merged at last into the proposed organization following the established custom of established parties fifty-two assembly districts held conventions and organized and elected delegates to a city convention from the remaining eleven districts delegates were appointed on october twenty ninth nineteen o nine the woman suffrage party was launched by a city convention at carnegie hall the floor was completely filled by the eight hundred and four delegates and two hundred alternates representing all the assembly districts of the city it was the largest delegated suffrage convention yet held the galleries were occupied by the general public the boxes and platform by prominent women and men well known in politics and world affairs the plan was there presented that the new organization should be modeled on that of the political parties first adopted by tammany hall and afterwards copied by all parties the organization proposed to go farther than the parties and unite the five counties which constituted the big city under an elected board of officers including a chairman for each county or borough and announced its intention to have not only a leader for each assembly district but a captain for each of the election districts the press found the undertaking unique and united in declaring it a genuinely political move the new york world said the woman suffrage party is now to be reckoned with as a political force it has a machine given that the machine operates harmoniously the woman suffrage party will be in a position to make deals with the older parties and to exercise political influence the suffragists are to be congratulated on their new tactics the new organization at once began search for two thousand one hundred and twenty seven captains holding election district assembly district 
borough and city meetings and drawing upon a long list of city men and women speakers to make its plea to the uninformed it established a city headquarters with press literature organization and political departments everyday bulletins were issued press parties were received weekly or oftener tons of literature were printed and distributed while the perfecting of the organization moved forward a systematic campaign to convert and interest political men formed the first main activity the next step was an attempt to convince the state suffrage association that the time had come to secure a referendum campaign while the submission of an amendment had been a pending question for two generations new york suffragists convinced in later years that such an amendment could not be carried had emphasized municipal suffrage and tax-paying suffrage for towns and cities which could be secured by act of the legislature they had won the school vote in eighteen eighty tax suffrage in third-class cities in nineteen o one and in nineteen ten they won township suffrage on bond issues these were merely entering wedges still sceptical upstate suffragists reluctantly yielded to the entreaties of the city suffragists no sooner was the november election of nineteen ten over than assembly district suffrage leaders accompanied by deputations from the elected assemblymen's own district waited upon him to plead for submission of a state suffrage amendment the leaders of the three assembly districts that composed each senatorial district heading deputations from all three called upon the senators the deputations followed each other in succession were often accompanied by reporters the press being actively interested in the result often to the annoyance of the member special cars carried the new york woman suffrage party representatives to albany and a wealthy intelligent society woman whose interest had been greatly stirred took upon herself the self-appointed task of securing the cooperation of the speaker of the assembly who was a relative of hers she came from the interview much chagrined and surprised something holds him it is not prejudice and i do not know what it is she reported the legislature of nineteen ten did not act but his failure to do so was not received as in earlier days with silent resignation instead in new york a procession an open-air protest meeting were held on may twenty first ten thousand people in union square listened to the speeches the suffragists made and furnished the largest suffrage demonstration ever held to that date in the united states it was also the beginning of the long line of huge american processions for woman suffrage footnote in nineteen o nine the college equal suffrage league organized the first of all suffrage parades it was small but it carried tremendous consequences End of footnote ninety automobiles were in line each decorated in yellow and behind them came marching on foot the college equal suffrage league in cap and gown the women's political union and the women of many trades many suffragists gathered upon the streets with the crowds too timid as yet to join in the procession but among them were some who became the boldest leaders of the spectacular campaign that was to follow the city party method did not immediately convert upstate suffragists nor attain its aim of securing a captain in each election district but the city membership grew from twenty thousand in nineteen ten to over five hundred thousand in nineteen seventeen and its work had grown more intensive each year each leader was instructed to gather her captains for frequent meetings and to teach them how to make a survey of their districts on their maps every church settlement school factory saloon house of prostitution store or shop was indicated and every moral agency was enlisted in the election district campaign mothers school and church meetings were held at which the suffragists talked with the women thirteen thousand public school teachers became members and workers street meetings were held in every assembly district for both men and women captains uniting to take charge of them rainbow flyers printed in ten colors and seven languages carrying the suffrage evangel in big type and simple terms were distributed at these meetings more formal meetings were held in such churches halls and hotels as were available and a special effort being made to place such meetings in the district headquarters of the democratic and republican parties every club church and organization was asked to grant space on its regular program for suffrage speakers and an occasional great city meeting was held in carnegie hall 
or cooper union always crowded to the doors to secure money for these campaigns bazaars rummage sales teas theatre parties plays picnics card parties and dances were constantly in progress a suffrage school was held to teach workers how to work by the new methods and so unquestioned became the results of the system that students attended from twenty-eight states this school was followed by many others by this agitation the suffrage question was soon lifted within the state to the acknowledged status of a political issue although the legislature of nineteen ten to nineteen eleven took no action that of nineteen twelve to nineteen thirteen passed a suffrage amendment by a vote of forty to two in the senate and one hundred and twenty five to five in the house this overwhelmingly favorable vote followed logically upon the suffragists systematized campaign to show legislators the strength of women's demand for the vote one member publicly announced that the women of his district did not want to vote whereupon the suffrage leader of that district asked him if he would meet the women who did a large american basement house was selected as the place and the lone assemblyman was not a little abashed at the sight of an overflowing first floor second floor stairs filled and crowds below striving to come up the next day he announced to the legislature that however the men of his district might feel he was convinced that the women did want to vote still another announced to the public through the press that he had caused a canvas of his own block to be made and his man canvasser had reported five women only who wanted to vote the leader of his district read the statement in her morning paper called up her helpers and the following morning the names of one hundred and eighty nine women who wanted to vote in that block were printed in the daily press the organization was proving practical what could the legislature do after all a submission is only passing the responsibility to the voters said the members the nineteen thirteen to nineteen fourteen legislature voted for a submission the required second time without a dissenting vote and the election was fixed for november nineteen fifteen the state suffrage association transformed itself into a woman suffrage party in nineteen fifteen what was called the empire state campaign committee combining all suffrage associations in the state and working through the chiefs of twelve campaign districts was organized and took charge of the campaign plans for simultaneous action for the workers in all parts of the state were formulated and executed with such precision that every woman engaged in suffrage stint or stunt knew that she was companioned by hundreds of other women who on that day were doing the same thing there were canvases and squads processions with banners and music meetings of every kind peripatetic headquarters gaily decorated and supplied with speakers and workers who went the rounds of each county visiting every town and post office on mother's day hundreds of churches and ceremonies and appeals for the new order and on the fourth of july the woman's declaration of independence was read from the steps of fifty courthouses new york city conducting its ceremonies of the day at the foot of the statue of liberty on bedloe's island for the first time in suffrage history there was a strongly organized press department with an auxiliary body the famous publicity council the two together devising and spreading broadcast suffrage publicity in the twenty-six languages in which newspapers were published in new york state the city campaign was more intensive than in any other part of the state as its political unit organization had been established longer and therefore worked more smoothly there were barbers days days for firemen street cleaners bankers brokers businessmen clergymen street car men factory workers students restaurant and railroad workers ticket sellers and choppers lawyers ditch diggers and longshoremen no voter escaped each one of these days had its own literature and attractions and called forth columns of comment in the newspapers evening demonstrations took place daily and brought interested and thoughtful crowds there was a bonfire on the highest hill in each borough with balloons flying music speeches and tableau illustrating women's progress from the primitive camp fire to the council of state torchlight processions were formed upon twenty-eight evenings with chinese lanterns balloons banners and decorations in yellow and ending in a street rally at some important point in the city there were street dances on the lower east side in honor of political leaders there were irish syrian italian polish rallies there were outdoor concerts a series of small ones culminating in a big one given in madison square park where a full orchestra played opera singers sang and many distinguished orators spoke on a platform erected for the purpose there were open-air religious services on sunday evenings with the moral and religious aspect of suffrage discussed there was a fete in beautiful dykeman Clen, 
there were flying squadrons of speakers from the battery to the bronx there was an interstate rally where the suffragists of massachusetts new jersey and new york met publicly in picturesque formation there was the new york to san francisco trip of the dancer joan sawyer to whom a letter was given at times square from eastern suffragists for western suffragists bottles containing suffrage messages were consigned to the ways from boats and wharves with appropriate speeches sandwich girls advertised meetings and sold papers sixty playhouses had theatre nights many with speeches between the acts there were innumerable movie nights with speeches and suffrage slides flying canvas wedges heights and automobile tours the entire state was stirred by the activities many things easy to do one white as publicity as when college women in cap and gown visited naturalization courts where hordes of ignorant men anxious to escape conscription in europe where the great war was now raging were being speedily manufactured into american citizens and voters there were other things that helped the agitation which had no publicity value such as travelling libraries in the correspondence classes of the equal franchise society there were german and french committees and committees to work with the protestant and catholic churches what rot said some what ingenuity said others surely the women have gone stark mad said others a woman physician who had been chief of a hospital in india for thirty years returned home to great britain to find english women in the turmoil of campaign for the vote she joined one of the great london processions and as she marched past the sidewalks lined with curious thousands she cried what fools men are what do you mean asked her fellow marcher why to make us do all these ridiculous things to get that which rightfully belongs to us just so new york women were deliberately doing the ridiculous thing in order to challenge men's attention and so make men think the campaign of nineteen fifteen thus kept itself before the public on the plane of the public every hour of every day suffragists themselves were passing through an unforgettable experience to this day they close their eyes and hear again the thrill of martial bugles the tread of marching thousands and see the air once more ablaze with the banners of those spectacular years just before election day a great procession possessed fifth avenue the entire suffrage forces of the state uniting in it every assembly district in the state sent its women twenty-five bands made music for thirty thousand marching men and women the streets and windows of the buildings on both sides were filled with lookers-on and there were more tears than jeers in that contemplation in the union league club a group of the great men in city affairs somewhat cynically watched the procession a break caused a lull in the interest then another band marched forward and behind it came five thousand of the public school teachers of the city they were soberly garbed in dark gowns with white hats and gloves their banners were black boards and on them their mottoes and messages were penciled in chalk they knew american history and they were telling it to the public as the endless line moved on one of the great men jumped to his feet and exclaimed my god men i never understood the menace of this woman's suffrage campaign as i do now here is a hundred dollars to defeat it who will join me footnote this man a democrat was completely converted when the women of california were alleged to have tipped the scale in the presidential election of nineteen sixteen and returned mr wilson to the white house End of footnote and the dollars came plentifully for the politically great find democracy troublesome the procession was to close with street meetings but the end did not come until long past the time set henry allen afterwards governor of kansas had come to new york to make a few suffrage speeches for the campaign he had made one but it had not satisfied him nor his audience he sat on a hotel balcony through the hours of the passing of the procession waiting to join in the street meetings which were scheduled to follow the next morning he came into the suffrage headquarters and with big honest tears in his eyes exclaimed i came to help in a campaign but this is not a campaign it is a crusade i understand now that day in a marathon speech beginning at ten a m and closing at ten p m he spoke continuously all day with only intervals enough to rest his voice and they were speeches which gripped the heart and compelled understanding no political party had endorsed the amendment but in new york women could serve as watchers at the polls because a special law to that effect had been passed it was estimated that two thousand five hundred women had held official positions in the organization of the empire state campaign committee that two hundred thousand women had aided the campaign and on election day six thousand three hundred and thirty women served as watchers or workers at the polls some serving from five a m until midnight the total cost of the campaign was about ninety five thousand dollars headquarters filled with anxious men and women on election night a few of the younger workers wept 
as adverse returns kept coming in but the older heads counselled don't give up forward march and when at midnight it was certain that the amendment was lost a group of young state and city women went forth to a public square where suffrage rallies had been a familiar sight called together the late street crowd homeward bound from theatres announced the result and declared that gathering the first meeting of the new campaign on friday night three days later an overflowing meeting was held in cooper union where one hundred thousand dollars was pledged for the new campaign every campaign district in the state offered its quota and no note of surrender was heard the new york amendment of nineteen fifteen was lost by a majority of one hundred and ninety four thousand nine hundred and eighty four the yes vote was five hundred and fifty three thousand three hundred and forty eight the no vote was seven hundred and forty eight thousand three hundred and thirty two in that year of nineteen fifteen there were three other campaigns in the neighboring states of massachusetts new jersey and pennsylvania the opposition centered upon new jersey where the vote came on registration day october nineteenth james r nugent democratic boss and reputed the ablest political maneuverer in the state led the opposition the democratic machine and the liquor interests worked openly against the amendment president wilson came home to vote for suffrage in princeton and the higher class of men of both parties espoused suffrage anti-suffrage ladies campaigned against it decrying government by the ignorant and on election day drunken rowdies and saloon henchmen marched up to the polls in solid phalanx to do what those ladies wanted done hundreds of men who came to register were allowed to vote at once on the amendment in one single district over five hundred names of men who attempted to register but were refused cast their votes against the amendment and those votes were not thrown out how could this happen the political novice may ask the answer is it happens the amendment was lost by a majority of fifty one thousand one hundred and eight there being one hundred and thirty three thousand two hundred and eighty two yes votes and one hundred and eighty four thousand three hundred and ninety no votes when two days later the great new york suffrage parade closed the new york suffrage campaign a dowdy section of new jersey women was a conspicuous feature in it with heads erect and firm step they marched forward their banners flying such mottoes as were still fighting no surrender victory merely postponed defrauded but not defeated the pennsylvania campaign had the most effective single publicity feature of any of the campaigns a replica of the independence bell was carried on a motor truck throughout the state and attracted great crowds to hear the accompanying suffrage speakers while independence hall and the independence bell are american pennsylvanians hold them in particular reverence and more closely their own the pennsylvania vote was proportionately the largest polled in any of the four states three hundred and eighty five thousand three hundred and forty eight four and four hundred and forty one thousand thirty four against massachusetts had been a lively suffrage centre from the early days and had probably given more money to western campaigns than any other state but it was also the centre of that form of conservatism which created the women's anti-suffrage movement the republican party had been in continuous power in the state and its organization had been unmoved by the suffrage appeal the amendment received one hundred and sixty two thousand six hundred and fifteen eyes and two hundred ninety five thousand seven hundred and two nays barely thirty five and a half per cent of the total vote whereas new jersey had polled for suffrage forty two per cent new york forty two and a half per cent and pennsylvania forty six per cent of the total vote on the suffrage question massachusetts suffragists considered that another campaign would be futile and the admirable advantage and fine spirit of the new jersey and pennsylvania suffragists were blocked by provisions in their state constitutions which precluded the resubmission of a defeated amendment until the lapse of five years at the national suffrage headquarters the responsible representatives of the four campaigns met a few days after the election to discuss the causes of failure and how to overcome them separate ballots used in new york and massachusetts and the acceptance of votes of men whose registration was refused in new jersey had given advantage to corrupt agencies which had unquestionably used them to the full the fact that the pennsylvania amendment had been printed on the main ballot where corruptionists had no means of checking the results of mobilized voters might easily explain its higher percent the new york workers already projecting their second campaign contended that the pennsylvania campaign had not gone far enough to awaken the full opposition and that the new york campaign had gone far enough to do that but not far enough to overcome opposition with that view they proceeded towards the next campaign the four amendments of nineteen fifteen had altogether polled one million two hundred and thirty four thousand five hundred and ninety three votes for suffrage that million and a quarter of favorable votes 
insured from the nation a vastly increased consideration of the cause the new york legislature of nineteen sixteen voted to resubmit the amendment the assembly by a majority of seventy nine the senate by a majority of twenty three the opposition to resubmission had so far disappeared before the legislature of nineteen seventeen met that the assembly passed it the second time by a vote of one hundred and seventeen ayes ten nays the senate thirty nine ayes seven nays the last vote was taken in march nineteen seventeen in april the nation entered the great world war the new york state woman suffrage party following the national suffrage association offered its organization for war service the state organization to the governor of the state and the city to the mayor war service committees were promptly organized these committees served as registrars in the governor's military census enrolled volunteered women for all sorts of war work sold bonds in each liberty loan and thrift stamp campaign and raised money in all the numerous drives for funds for foreign or home relief or helps to the soldiers knitting teams supplied thousands of woolen garments for the red cross there were war gardens to produce food canning demonstrations to preserve food and the distribution of food pledge cards designed to economize food a recreation hut at plattsburg for white soldiers and one at yafank for colored troops were maintained money was raised for the overseas hospitals that had been organized and were being maintained by the national suffrage association but the suffragists of nineteen seventeen had read history they knew how prone men were to accept the help of suffragists in the hour of need and forget women's case for suffrage in the hour of calm so while working loyally and energetically as special war organizations in support of the needs of the nation in its time of crisis the new yorkers did not lay aside their campaign in the nineteen fifteen campaign one of the stock insistences of the indifferent and opposed had been new york women do not want to vote to meet it the empire state campaign committee had dared claim a million new york women want to vote the claim had been laughed at and pooh pooh but it had had enough vitality to pass into campaign history in the form of a slogan but unsupported the claim was not conclusive even in nineteen fifteen the need of supplying incontrovertible evidence had been encountered on every hand and the close of the campaign had found a plan of proof well matured this plan covering no less an undertaking than the assembling of the personal signatures of the million women of the state who wanted to vote was the heavy heritage of the workers of the nineteen seventeen campaign with dogged endurance they canvassed door to door in an effort to secure the signatures of women to a petition to voters to vote for suffrage on election day they climbed stairs descended into cellars found their way into the homes of the rich and the incredibly poor walked country lanes left no section untouched in the result they piled up the largest individually signed petition ever collected one million thirty thousand names all of new york state women appealing to men for the vote next in order was the problem of how to make the public realize the enormous force of that petition in the city a ceremony was arranged and the mayor and other prominent officials came to the city headquarters to verify the numbers and all the petitions went to albany to allow the governor and state officials to verify them press parties in new york and albany gave opportunity to newspaper correspondents and the associated press to verify them at the state headquarters the petitions were pasted upon huge pasteboards and the general public allowed to inspect them in the great procession that closed the suffrage campaign the chief feature was the display of these petitions each of the placards was borne by two women marching four abreast in a special section with banners giving the totals in all the upstate districts the city section displayed its petition as sixty-three ballot boxes one for each assembly district resting upon a decorated platform and each borne by four women the procession of the petitions alone covered more than half a mile and was the most conspicuous feature of those thousands who went marching by to the music of forty bands meanwhile ten million leaflets were distributed schools for training women watches were conducted and ten thousand watchers and poll workers were enrolled hundreds of newspapers were served with daily news including twenty-four foreign language papers the voters were circularized friendly windows were filled with posters silent speeches and printed appeals and as a climax advertisements announcing the number of women petitioners for the vote and carrying various appeals to the voters were placed in the leading newspapers of the state huge billboards advertising suffrage lined the railroads and street cars and electric signs in the cities emphasized the woman's appeal meanwhile the women antis were busy and working hard in the subway stations they put up advertising billboards carrying false and misleading statements the suffragists wishing to answer them asked for space of the advertising company 
in control of the advertising privileges of the stations no space could be begged or bought the company was advocating the other side the election was coming in a few days and every available woman was already engaged in campaign work yet from a hasty conference emerged a plan and the necessary pledges of service the answers to the offending billboards were printed upon small posters together with the statement that advertising space had been denied the suffragists women turning themselves into living billboards and calling themselves the lapboard brigade paid their fares and rode up and down the subway lines all day long carrying the posters every day millions of passengers looked upon the fashionably gowned society women who performed the mission and read the lapboard messages with astonished enlightenment a few days before election the executive committee of tammany hall met there were members there whose wives were now suffrage captains and assembly district leaders for the woman suffrage party had carried its organization from palace to tenement from schoolhouse to church these men pleaded with the directors of the great political machine to give the amendment a chance and it was finally voted to keep hands off in the election orders to this effect were passed to tammany leaders and captains and the good news found its way by the grapevine route to the city chairman of the woman suffrage party the upstate republicans were divided governor whitman seeking re-election was opposed by the regular organization had been forced to form an organization of his own this he urged to use its best offices for the suffrage amendment and this were to pass down the lines but in the camp of the regulars the same old instructions were given outside the city the amendment was lost by one thousand five hundred and ten votes but in the city it carried by one hundred and three thousand eight hundred and sixty three majority so that the tammany hands-off injunction won the state by a majority of one hundred and two thousand three hundred and fifty three upstate republican regulars peevishly chid the tammany leaders for this traitorous act with a why didn't you tell us you were going to let it through the women antis and their allies immediately published the charge that the state had been won by german pro-german pacifist and socialist votes each class being at that time anathema the charges set the suffragists and the press upon the task of analyzing the vote it was found that the strongly republican and democratic districts had polled a larger suffrage vote proportionately than the german and socialist districts and that the uptown residence sections of the city had exceeded the radical downtown districts in approving the amendment in truth all parties races nationalities and religions supported the amendment the intensive campaign which had carried the appeal direct to every man and woman black and white educated and ignorant and to each in the language of his nationality with the supplementary campaign of reminder through the press and in hundreds of spectacular ways had won the day every suffragist who had worked throughout the campaign was convinced that the intensive plan of organization which covered and took cognizance of every block and emphasized in every procession and banner press interview or advertisement the political character of the organization was the great factor which had won the victory in the city the cradle of the party suffrage work had never paused from october nineteen o nine to november nineteen seventeen thousands of women had come into the campaign and gone out again too tired to continue but there were hundreds who worked every day for the eight years as hard as men work in a campaign for a few weeks to find themselves exhausted at the end ten thousand women all trained in watchers schools worked at the polls this ceaseless insistence had been supplemented by the liberal spirit of a war period and the daily account of the crucial service women were rendering overseas then too the backbone of the liquor opposition had been broken by the winning of the federal prohibition campaign political leaders pronounced the suffrage victory in the empire state a political miracle the bosses from ocean to ocean listened in and recognized that the coming of woman suffrage could no longer be postponed supplementing the great new york victory had come other victories the delegates to the atlantic city suffrage convention who went home to put through that program of getting presidential suffrage in every available state had been indeed putting it through during the year nineteen seventeen the legislatures of five states ohio indiana rhode island nebraska and michigan had given women the right to vote for the president of the united states and arkansas had given them the right to vote in the primaries which in arkansas a one-party state had all the force of voting at the elections the number of presidential electors for whom women were entitled to vote had been increased over one hundred and fifty per cent by legislative grant in the twelve months instead of ninety-one it was now two hundred and thirty-two the mandate from the country to congress which earlier suffragists had sought from the states had been given and the way was opened after forty years of wandering in the wilderness 
as miss anthony had called it for the submission of the federal suffrage amendment End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of woman suffrage and politics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org woman suffrage and politics the inner story of the suffrage movement by carrie chapman catt and nettie rogers schuler section twenty three more victories and more defeats as a consequence of the adoption of suffrage resolutions by the two major political parties in the conventions of nineteen sixteen friends of the suffrage cause in many state legislatures proposed amendments to state constitutions providing for the enfranchisement of women by referenda in some states these resolutions passed one house only but from nineteen sixteen to nineteen nineteen there were submissions in seven states besides new york west virginia maine michigan oklahoma south dakota louisiana and texas it so happened that in west virginia when the campaign opened in nineteen sixteen the same woman was president of the state woman's christian temperance union and the suffrage association a connection never made before in the life of the two organizations there was some rejoicing in the ranks of the woman's christian temperance union that the leadership of the campaign had fallen to one of their number who could thus command the aid of their organization and through it reached the churches in behalf of suffrage so many state suffrage campaigns had been lost that it was natural that the woman's christian temperance union should have come to distrust somewhat the ability of the suffragists to conduct winning campaigns ever since eighteen eighty two the women's christian temperance union had had a franchise department which aimed to educate its following to a belief in women's suffrage addresses made by women's christian temperance union speakers presenting the faith that the ballot in the hands of women would destroy the rum traffic contributed much to the fears of the wet interests women's christian temperance union women believed that the church vote which was the main support of prohibition would follow their lead in suffrage campaigns yet often when they had desired to initiate suffrage campaigns on their own account these same women had magnanimously given way to the suffrage organizations whose sole object was secure the enfranchisement of women the west virginia campaign became then the women's christian temperance union's suffrage opportunity the state had had a prohibition campaign the year before and the question had carried by a majority of a hundred thousand the wets were infuriated by the prohibition victory and especially incensed by the stringency of the enforcement law and they determined at any cost to defeat the suffrage amendment they did defeat it too by a majority of ninety eight thousand and sixty seven nearly as large as the majority the year before for prohibition yet the campaign was a good one not one recognized means of campaigning was overlooked and several features were remarkably well done a flying squadron of prominent men women speakers was sent to thirty points in the state and ex-governor judges and members of the state legislature were among the speakers twenty organizers were in the field the voters were thoroughly circularized with general literature and two hundred thousand congressional speeches on suffrage were mailed them there was advertising in all of the rural newspapers at both democratic and republican state conventions there were evidences of the attempts of the wets to organize the opposition resolutions passed endorsing the amendment were ineffective because of this wet control to this opposition were added the many church dries who still adhered to ideas of women's sphere outworn in northern states moreover no state campaign ever quite so completely rallied the drunks and the ne'er-do-wells of all kinds on election day as did west virginia's the vote was eyes sixty three thousand five hundred and forty nays one hundred and sixty one thousand six hundred and seven while the campaign for votes for women was going on in new york another was in progress in maine here the suffrage strength was limited to small groups in a few of the large cities however the women's christian temperance union had been for many years a thoroughly well organized and highly influential body their members were chagrined at the failure in west virginia and welcomed the opportunity of another trial of their forces 
An officer and prominent worker in their organization acted as chairman of the campaign committee. The campaign was a short one, lasting only five months and closing with the election in September 1917. The argument for suffrage was never put before the voters of any state more thoroughly. They were circularized with a suffrage speech made in the United States Senate by William Shafroth, and again with Have You Heard the News, which carried the latest statement of the suffrage gains the world around. The same envelope, which was mailed to each voter of the state, carried a printed petition over the signatures of the women of the county in which he resided. In these petitions, there was better proof than any state had yet given that the women wanted the vote. House-to-house -house distribution of flyers was made in several communities. A million and a half leaflets were distributed, ten to every voter in the state. The clergy were circularized three times, the state grange, the committees of the political parties, and members of the legislature twice. About 500 meetings were held. An ex-chairman of the Democratic State Central Committee talked and worked for suffrage. The President of the United States appealed to the Democrats by letter. The Republican governor, a popular man, spoke for it. Yet, the amendment was defeated. Nays, 38,838. Ayes, 20,604. The vote was one of the smallest in the state's history. 100,000 men who voted the year before did not go to the polls. 38,000 women petitioned for the vote, and only 20,000 men answered yes. It was at least clear that men do not vote as their wives tell them to, nor, put to the acid test of numbers, could the result be taken as the voice of the people. The campaigns of Colorado in 1893 and Idaho in 1896 cost a thousand and eight hundred dollars each that of california in eighteen ninety six where all the large cities carried except san francisco sacramento and oakland cost eighteen thousand dollars the campaign in maine cost the national suffrage association fifteen thousand two hundred and sixty eight dollars what then was wrong with maine a worker in the campaign gave these reasons for defeat natural conservatism the picketing of the White House, the war, but of far greater influence the antagonism of the two political machines and the pronounced wet opposition which was in evidence from the first. No outsider would believe that there was wet opposition in the supposedly dry state of Maine, but the truth was the Brewers had never entirely given up Maine. In 1911, after several attempts, they secured a referendum on the question whether the Prohibition Amendment should be resubmitted, the vote resulting in a majority against resubmission. Representatives of the Brewers Association were sent to the state in 1915 to make a secret survey, writing in February of that year to the president of the United Brewers Association. Percy Andre said, The press of Maine has obtained knowledge of the investigation now proceeding, Fortunately, our men have nearly completed their work, but they have had to go back into the state under another guise. In a report printed later, these men stated that all of Maine was for prohibition, but only a small part for enforcement. Note, a Senate investigation, brewing and liquor interests and German propaganda, volume 1, page 1048, exhibit number 838. End of note. In 1918, there were seven state suffrage campaigns, three of which were successful, South Dakota, Michigan, and Oklahoma, all conducted under the most difficult and distracting conditions. The handicaps of war and an influenza epidemic affected all states equally. As a preliminary to the campaigns, the National Suffrage Association contributed suffrage schools to these states for the purpose of instructing the workers. Later, it supplied 18 organizers, press helps, 100,000 posters, 2,528,000 pieces of literature, 18 street banners, and 50,000 buttons. One requirement for assistance from the National Suffrage Association was that each state should secure signatures of women on petitions for suffrage. The combined number obtained by the three states was 310,687. The cost of these campaigns to the National Suffrage Association was $30,720 in addition to expenses borne by the states. In South Dakota, as in nine other states in 1918, the foreign-born could vote on their first papers, 
and citizenship was not a qualification for the vote. Six prior campaigns for suffrage have been defeated each time by a mobilization of this alien vote by American-born political manipulators. In 1918, the tables turned. The war had created a feeling of caution concerning voting privileges in the hands of the aliens, and South Dakota was aroused to make a change in its law in this respect. The South Dakota women, smarting under the defeat of 1916, at which time their amendment had been last lost by the foreign vote, mainly of German Russians in nine counties, saw their opportunity and urged a bill which would combine woman suffrage and the qualifications of citizenship for all voters. Suffragists were willing to forego the opportunity offered because of the pressure of war work, but members of the legislature said, Quote, we look to the women to wage the best campaign they have ever waged, unquote. So the women went to work to such purpose that the suffrage majority was 19,286. The cost of the campaign was $7,500. The small cost being due to the absence of the organized opposition that usually entered a campaign state from the outside, this absence being due in turn to the alien clause in the amendment, a state official having pointed out early in the campaign that should outsiders attempt to come into the state to work against the amendment, they would be turned back on the grounds that they were unpatriotic, undemocratic, un-American. The campaign in Michigan was unique because of its cooperative basis. The National Suffrage Association's state auxiliary had the assistance of both political parties and their representatives. Professional and businessmen formed themselves into a federation to give more effective aid. All three states acknowledged that the petitions of women to the voters were a determining factor in the victory. Michigan obtained 202,000 names on these petitions. One state suffragist said, and her letter was typical of many others, quote, We decided that our last shot should be the publication of 14,000 signatures of women who had asked the men in our town to vote yes. The names filled three newspapers and was the talk of the town. Unquote. The amendment carried by a majority of 34,506. Eyes, 229,790. Nays, 195,284. The Oklahoma campaign of 1918 was not the first in that state. The story of 1899 has already been sketched. In 1910, suffragists obtained 40,000 signatures on an initiative petition and forced the submission of the question to the voters. This was defeated at the polls that year. Eyes 88,808, nays 128,928. In 1917, some members of the Board of the Suffrage Association of Oklahoma and the Legislative Committee of the Oklahoma State Federation of Women's Clubs jointly secured the passage of a bill providing for a state referendum on woman suffrage in November 1918. Oklahoma is one of the states whose constitutions require a majority of the highest number of votes cast in the general election to carry an amendment. Every ballot cast in the election which fails to record an opinion on the amendment is termed a silent vote and is counted as a negative vote. It is a task to arouse the voter to such a degree of interest that he remembers to mark his ballot on amendments. Suffragists were pessimistic and said it can't be done. The severe heat of the summer and a third consecutive drought with crop failure made local handicaps many and difficult. Both Democratic and Republican parties gave assistance, their state conventions passing strong resolutions for suffrage. During the campaign, one and a half million pieces of suffrage literature were distributed, and during its last week, 126,000 copies of a suffrage supplement went out through the newspapers of the state. The National Suffrage Association gave 11 organizers to the state and spent $18,000 in the campaign. The National Suffrage Association's representatives responsible for the campaign were able from the first to locate the center of opposition in Oklahoma. It lay in what was called the Capitol Ring and included the governor, Robert L. Williams, the lieutenant governor, Edward Trapp, the Attorney General, S.P. Freeling, and the Secretary of the State Elections Board, who was also a Senator, W.C. McAllister. These four men had the reputation of holding in their hands the power to defeat any measure in the state. All of them openly opposed the amendment, but the first evidence of effective hostility was revealed in August 1918 when it was generally alleged that the Secretary of the Elections Board had told the women antis from the North to go home.
as the failure of the secretary of state to supply the official wording of the suffrage amendment to the elections board ninety days before election would keep the question of woman suffrage off the ballot an appeal was made to judge ledbetter of oklahoma city who had become the legal adviser of the suffragists and to mr lyons secretary of state to the persistent work of these two men was due the fact that this obstacle was finally removed and the amendment was printed as it was necessary to obtain a majority of all the votes cast at the election the suffragists desired the amendment to be on the regular ballot if it were not there the old tricks which had so often defeated suffrage amendments would probably be repeated the elections board could do as it chose and its members decided to use a separate ballot a large part of the campaign was necessarily devoted to educating the electorate to the task of marking the separate ballot the most successful device was the printing of a million red white and blue leaflets showing a separate sample ballot with the amendment and the correct way to mark it with a reminder that if a man forgot to vote he was recorded as voting no the next bumper was the discovery that the elections board had printed only half as many suffrage ballots as regular ballots to offset that local workers were informed they could legally have extra ballots printed at state expense wherever there was a shortage and they were also urged to have sworn statements of any fraud detected sent to the suffrage headquarters on october sixteenth oklahoma soldiers voted in seven camps bowie macarthur logan travis cody norman and dix and presently it was discovered that suffrage amendment ballots had not been furnished for them the evidence was collected as speedily as possible and turned over to judge ledbetter and an appeal was made to governor williams who finally agreed to see that suffrage ballots were sent to fort sill where too the soldiers were to vote in a few days later he suggested that two representatives from the campaign suffrage committee go at state expense to the cantonments where elections had already been held and take the vote on the amendment adding i must also send two from the anti-suffrage organization he went so far as to give the representatives of the national suffrage association letters to the commanding officers at the camps these letters read october twenty eighth nineteen eighteen from the governor of the state of oklahoma to the commanding officer of camp bowie fort worth texas subject matter of soldiers voting on constitutional amendment one it has been brought to my attention that in some of the army camps ballots were not furnished to the soldiers so that they had an opportunity to vote on the constitutional amendment regarding to women's suffrage in oklahoma i see no objection where the soldiers were furnished with the proper forms for affidavit and ballot to separately cast their votes through the mails on this constitutional amendment where the soldiers desire to qualify for this purpose by making the affidavit i see no objection to the proper officers taking their affidavit for such purpose although they have heretofore voted for national state or county offices i suggest however that the soldier mail his ballot on the constitutional amendment to the same person to whom he mailed his vote to be cast for him in his home precinct for national state or county officers in order that my meaning may be made clear i see no objection to the soldier voting separately on the constitutional amendment and sending the same separately to the same person to whom the vote was sent on national state or county officers to be cast and i would be very glad to see this done so that every soldier should have an opportunity to vote on this constitutional amendment r l williams this sounded well but it was now october twenty eighth with the election scheduled for november fifth it was impossible for the suffragists to send workers to seven widely separated camps besides they were suspicious of a trap warned by previous experiences they had made an exhaustive study of the election law and they knew that the soldier was entitled to return only one sealed envelope if he had already sent one containing his vote for state officials he could not legally send another with his vote on the suffrage amendment in the meantime to prevent a repetition of what had happened in other camps instructions had been given to the suffrage captain at lawton near fort still to prepare for the election the democrat sent by the board of elections arrived the night before the vote was to be taken the suffragists were on the watch and at eleven p m they found he had no suffrage ballots this possibility had been anticipated and met by the printing of four hundred ballots the next morning at eight o'clock suffragists went to the tent where the voting was to take place neither voters nor officials appeared 
there was a deluge of rain the women tramped from one military post to the other and at last discovered that the democratic and republican representatives were in a motor car taking the vote at the different regimental headquarters a colonel taking pity on the women agreed to send the suffrage ballots to the various headquarters and at five p m drenched and fatigued the suffragists started for home but the soldiers did not get their ballots Signed statements to this effect were obtained from the representatives of both parties who had conducted the elections at the camps, and from the soldiers themselves, many of whom wrote home to suffrage mothers to ask why they had not been allowed to vote on women's suffrage. The number of votes thus lost was estimated at 4,197, that being the number of soldiers in the camps who voted for state officials. From the beginning, those responsible for the campaign had emphasized the necessity of women at every precinct on election day to act both as watchers inside the polling booth and outside to remind the men that woman suffrage was to be voted on. When in any town one political party denied the women the privilege of watching, the National Suffrage Association's representatives made a point of securing appointments as regular watchers for the other party. When the list of watchers was completed, printed slips were sent them with spaces for name of county, town, number of voting precincts, and the for and opposed, blank, void, and total vote, with, with space for name of chairman of elections board and name of watcher with the statement, I certify that the above is correct. Watchers were asked to telephone returns to suffrage headquarters as early as possible election night, but if for any reason the count was delayed, the women were told to remain at their posts and mail the tally slips as soon as possible. To this precaution, the women of Oklahoma owe the fact that they were able to keep their vote after it had been won. The work of the suffragists was so well done that although the polls did not close on election day until seven o'clock, returns from all precincts in Oklahoma City except three were in by nine o'clock and showed that 39 of the 51 precincts had been carried for the amendment. Oklahoma County had been considered the most difficult in the state and it was predicted that the result in that county would indicate the returns from the state at large. By midnight, returns were in from 15 counties and all indicated majorities in favor. But workers were everywhere cautioned not to claim victory publicly, for if they did, the familiar trick used in other states would undoubtedly be practiced. That is, returns from districts under control of unscrupulous election officials would be held back until the favorable majorities had been reported and then an adverse vote would be piled up out of these delayed returns sufficient to overcome the favorable majorities. The morning after election, the Daily Oklahoman printed returns showing that 23 counties had been carried for suffrage. The state elections board began to show signs of worry. Two days later, the suffragists caused the publication of a statement by a member of the state elections board declaring that the suffrage amendment had carried in 23 counties. Local workers were instructed to procure at once the returns from a list of 33 counties. Two members of the Elections Board frankly admitted that an effort was being made to count out the amendment and gave suffragists a list of counties where work to this end had begun. Returns from certain counties were being held back. There were unaccountable discrepancies in the figures of the State Elections Board and those received by the suffragists. In 1916, Attorney General S.P. Freeling had made a ruling in the case of Murray v. McGowan, asking for a recount, quote, that the Elections Board could not go behind the returns certified to it by the county elections boards, unquote. It was clear that if the suffragists could secure the returns on their slips, signed by the chairman of the county elections boards, and have them printed in as many city, county, and local newspapers as possible, there would be less chance of the figures being changed at the headquarters of the elections board. All day Saturday and Sunday, women remained at the telephone, confirming and checking returns, and on Monday were ready with a report of 63 out of 77 counties. Of these, only six had lost, one by one vote, two by three, and one by six. During this time, the suffragists were told that the Secretary of the State Elections Board had been asking officials in certain counties to open the sealed boxes and give returns from the stub books, which would include all mutilated and spoiled ballots. This would have been to repeat old election history in Oklahoma. After the Oklahoma election of 1916, just such fraudulent procedures had been charged and, in the opinion of many, proved. 
It made the watching suffragists tremble to consider the possibilities, but trembling, they stayed steadfastly on guard at their posts. Meantime, the state was greatly aroused. Many men who had winked at election fraud in the old days now assured the suffragists that they wanted the women to get a square deal. A campaign of letters, telegrams, and telephones to the governor was begun, and he, as well as the chairman of the elections board, was informed that the suffragists held affidavits of attempts at fraud. The governor was a candidate for a federal judgeship, and when prominent men over the state telephoned him and congressmen from Washington wired him to know what the elections board was trying to do, it was plainly seen that he wished he were out of it. On Thursday, November 14th, the Daily Oklahoman printed a statement that the governor and the members of the state elections board admitted that the returns showed that the suffrage amendment had carried. But the joy of the suffragists was short-lived. The governor and the elections board had made the statement to relieve themselves of public criticism, but at the instigation of Attorney General Freeling, a protest against certification by the elections board was entered. This was signed by the officers of the Oklahoma Association opposed to women's suffrage and members of the advisory board. These officers were Mrs. T. H. Sturgeon of Oklahoma City, President, Miss Alice Robertson of Muskogee, Vice President, who was the second woman to be elected to Congress, coming into office with the Republican landslide of 1920, and Mrs. Eugene Lorton of Tulsa, Secretary. There was little public sympathy for this eleventh-hour effort of the antis to block the amendment. Most people believed the measure had carried, and all believed that the antis were attempting to base hopes for defeat of the amendment upon slim technicalities. The newspapers very generally condemned the protest and pronounced it flimsy. It was based on the fact that the returns from counties had not separated the soldier from the civilian vote. The totals included both votes, and separation could have no bearing on results. The aim was to increase the silent vote. The well-laid plans of the opposition to count out the soldiers had not brought a significant number to defeat the amendment. After much dallying, Governor Williams called for the election returns, and without certification by the elections board, proclaimed on December 3rd that woman suffrage had carried. At the time, it was agreed by the attorneys representing both sides in a formal hearing before the governor that the actual filing of the document should be withheld for three days in order to give the anti-suffrage attorneys an opportunity to institute proceedings against the Secretary of State or through some other avenue of attack. They stated at that time that the validity of the adoption of the amendment would be contested. The three days expired December 6th, and no notice having been served in injunction proceedings, the document was made a matter of record. Thus it was carried and recorded the Second Amendment to the State Constitution of Oklahoma. The vote was ayes 106,909, nays 81,481. The majority on the amendment was 25,428. The majority of the amendment on all votes cast at the election was 9,791. The tricksters had been defeated. While this campaign was going on in Oklahoma, another was in progress in Louisiana, the first referendum on woman suffrage in the South. It had the support of Governor Pleasant, who in his message to the legislature had urged the great importance of the South's realizing the danger from the proposed submission of the federal woman suffrage amendment. A bitter, three-cornered senatorial fight being underway, the women were asked to postpone their activities until after the September primaries, which they did. Full preparations for a whirlwind campaign for October had been made when an influenza epidemic broke out and the people were not allowed to assemble in any section of the state. A deluge of rain and the consequent impassable condition of the roads prevented any work in outlying districts. Thus there could be little campaign of personal appeal to the voters. Notwithstanding these adverse conditions, the majority against the amendment was only 3,500, nearly all of it in New Orleans. In that city, Mayor Martin Behrman, through the ward bosses of a well-controlled machine, issued direct orders for defeat. Many parishes gave reports of precincts not open at all on account of the epidemic and the weather. The last referendum in any state on woman suffrage before the ratification of the federal woman suffrage amendment came in Texas on May 24, 1919. The Texas legislature had already given women primary suffrage, 
The vote was taken on enfranchising women and requiring full citizenship as a qualification for the vote. There were only three months in which to reach the voters in 253 counties, and partially naturalized aliens were to be allowed to vote on the question while soldiers and women were to be debarred. 400 women suffrage leaders and 1,495 speakers were the medium through which 3 million flyers and 200,000 copies of Texas Democrats, edited and managed for this occasion by Dr. A. Caswell Ellis of the faculty of the University of Texas, reached the voters. The press, both rural and urban, gave magnificent support. More than 90 small papers issued a four-page suffrage supplement, while some of the most noteworthy editorials ever appearing in the pages of the big dailies were written in behalf of woman suffrage. On the other hand, every nook and corner of the state was flooded with anti-literature, much of it mailed from Selma, Alabama. This literature was of such a vilely insinuating character that the day it was put upon their desks, the representatives put aside all other business and passed a resolution with only five dissenting votes, condemning its circulation. Despite the fact that press, pulpit, educators, professional and laboring men, and the organized Democrats of the state and nation stood behind the amendment, it failed by 25,000 votes. The impeached ex-governor, James E. Ferguson, who was at war with all stable influences in the state, was alleged to have been one of the chief manipulators of this vote. After the defeat in May, he said in a public statement that he never felt better in his life. My crops are fine, my cattle are fat, and my crowd beat woman suffrage. Thus, eight state referenda in two and a half years foot up four victories and four defeats. The total number of fully enfranchised women was now over seven and a quarter million in 15 states. And so successful had been the work for presidential suffrage that these seven and a quarter million full-fledged voting women were flanked by eight million more who could vote for president in 12 other states, 13 if Vermont, where the legislative grant of presidential suffrage was in question, be included. Moreover, Texas, another one-party state, had followed the lead of Arkansas and granted primary suffrage to women. All told, the number of electoral votes affected by the fact of women's suffrage was 326 out of the total electoral college of 531. It meant the end of state referenda. No more educating the public to believe that the vote would not in some mysterious way throttle women's maternal instincts. No more climbing to topmost tenements and descending to bottommost basements to plead with illiterates and foreign-born. The day of triumph of the federal suffrage amendment was at hand. End of chapter 20, section 23, read by Sandra in Montreal, 2021. Chapter 21, Part 1 of Woman, Suffrage and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Woman, Suffrage and Politics. The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Shuler. Chapter 21, Part 1, The Congress of the United States Surrenders It is doubtful if any group, men or women, who ever kept ward and watch over legislation at Washington, ever came to know the true inwardness of the Congress of the United States as suffragists came to know it. For one thing, the suffrage vigil was so long maintained. For another, it engaged the energies of so many different women with so many different points of view from so many different parts of the country, all flashing in their reflections of the congressional body, like so many mirrors held up to nature, man's nature, at every conceivable angle. Toward the end of the vigil, they were coming and going from the headquarters of the National American Woman Suffrage Association at Washington, from every state in the Union, in relays of dozens, of fifties, of hundreds. They constituted the largest lobby ever maintained at the National Capitol, the front door lobby, as the press called it, in tribute to its above-board methods and policy. 
They learned Congress through and through, those women. Its way of work, its machinery, its tricks. The men in it, their pet foibles, their fundamental weaknesses, their finer abilities, their human quality. Quietly sitting in the galleries of House or Senate, listening to floor speeches or watching floor tactics they learned. They learned talking across desks in animated discussion with those same men in private, senatorial and House offices, pleading at public hearings before committees of House or Senate. They learned the cheap bipartisanship that dominates the Congress, its insensate capacity to block justice for party advantage. They learned that the state's rights cry of the Southern congressmen voiced a great principle to be used as expediency dictated, now hushed into self-righteous acquiescence in federal control of the liquor question, now raised in uproar against federal interference in the suffrage question. They learned that Massachusetts Republicans could find it in their hearts to be stern state writers when it came to the point of defeating suffrage, though determined federalists on all other scores. They learned that in the state legislators, so in the federal Congress, there was the imprint of something dark and sinister, something that suggested and interfered and often controlled the old trail and the old invisible enemy. And finally, they learned that here and there in the Congress were men who stood up like mountain peaks, as unswerving in their devotion to the principle of self-government as they were intelligent in their understanding of it. It was on these men that suffragists banked their hopes as they went forward with their final programme to secure the submission of the Federal Suffrage Amendment, a programme that after January 1917 had to be shaped at every step by the impending exigencies of war. Early in 1917, the National American Woman Suffrage Association called its Executive Council to meet in Washington prior to the opening of the special war session of the Congress scheduled for April of that year. By its authority at a great theatre meeting packed to the doors, it pledged the loyalty of its organisation to the country in the event of war and offered its services at command. The offer was received in person by the Secretary of War. The association keenly alive to the fact that idealism was aroused by the crisis of war, urged its constituency to unite at once in a stupendous appeal to Congress for the immediate submission of the amendment. The appeal followed. Letters, telegrams and petitions poured in on the Congress by hundreds and thousands. Men were talking in that day an hour of democracy, of liberty and justice as they had taught after the Civil War. Yet in the light of past experience, suffragists had little faith in any real change in the reactionaryism of Congress. So little faith that in a conference on the Congressional campaign, a resolution was adopted to the effect that if the 65th Congress should fail to submit the Federal Suffrage Amendment before the next Congressional election, the Suffrage Association should select a sufficient number of senators and representatives for replacement to ensure passage by the 66th Congress. In the War Congress, five senators introduced the suffrage resolution in the Senate and six members in the House, one being Miss Jeanette Rankin of Montana, the first woman member of Congress. Hearings followed in quick order. The Senate Committee, for the first time, voted unanimously to recommend its passage. In the House, an incredible amount of work had been put into an attempt to secure a suffrage committee. The Judiciary Committee systematically opposing and blocking its consideration. But on September 24, 1917, the House voted itself a suffrage committee by a vote of 180 to 107 with three answering present and 142 not voting. It had taken four years of ceaseless agitation to secure this result. Of the favourable votes, 
82 were Democratic, 96 Republican. Of the unfavourable, 74 were Democratic and 32 Republican. Of those not voting, 59 were Democratic and 81 were Republican. In November came the decisive suffrage victory in New York. Forthwith, up and down and across the nation, resistance began to crumble. Inevitably, the effect reacted upon Congress. In December, the National American Woman Suffrage Association held its annual convention in Washington. During this convention, each senior senator was asked to invite the junior senator and the House membership of his state to his office on a fixed morning and to allow the suffrage delegation from home to address them. Thirty such get-together meetings were held, congressional delegations from the smaller states combining to receive their suffrage delegates. In the afternoon, the suffrage delegates met again in convention, and the role of states was called. The president of each responding with a brief account of the morning's experience. A thrill of approaching triumph possessed the big convention, when to the call of Arkansas, the clear-cut tones of its president responded. The Arkansas congressmen, with two exceptions, say they will be pleased to vote for the federal amendment. If the border states were coming in, all would go well. As the sense of that fact penetrated, a glad shout went up, which none present who did not know history would have understood. State after state followed, with such favourable reports of pledges that none could doubt the approach of victory. A speech in the form of an address to Congress was later made by the President of the National American Woman Suffrage Association at a great public meeting and adopted by the Convention and a deputation of suffragists from each state handed a printed copy to their senators and representatives. Yet the road to victory was not to be strewn with roses. The chairman of the Congressional Committee of the National Suffrage Association reported that the new Congress had brought three sharp surprises. One, the discovery that, because there was likely to be a struggle over the chairmanship of the new committee on woman suffrage, many of the Democratic leaders were inclined to defer indefinitely the appointment of members of the committee. Two, the announcement by Democratic leader Kitchen that the suffrage amendment would be voted upon on December 17th a most unpropitious date, being the day before that assigned for the vote on the Prohibition Amendment. 3. The determination of Chairman Webb of the Judiciary Committee to have his committee report the suffrage amendment. In spite of the fact that the Woman Suffrage Committee had been created late in the previous session for the specific purpose of dealing with the suffrage question. Mr Webb held that his committee alone possessed the right to deal with constitutional amendments. To offset these plans of opposed members required work every day and all day and most of the night on the part of the association's congressional committee. But all the obstacles were finally overcome and a woman's suffrage committee was put in operation December 15th with Mr Raker of California as chairman. The suffrage amendment being extricated from the vexatious contest over jurisdiction was transferred to it from the Judiciary Committee and the date for voting on the amendment was postponed to a more propitious date to be set in the future. The new suffrage committee, with energy before unknown, gave five entire days to suffrage hearings and at last committee smiles of old reserved for the antis, were turned towards the suffragists. The Rules Committee settled the date for the vote as January 10th, 1918. 53 members of Congress were secured as a steering committee to organise the friends of the suffrage measure in the House. The month before the vote was tense with work and hope. A far-flung yet intensive publicity campaign drove the question of the amendment into every nook and cranny of the nation. From home constituencies, the pressure on congressmen became tremendous, while on the ground, in Washington, 
suffrage representatives of those constituencies besieged Capitol and Senate and House office buildings. When the day of the vote, January 10th, finally arrived, Capital and Nation were awaiting the day's roll call with taut interest. The moment the House galleries were opened, suffragists and general public, packed for hours in the foyers, surged eagerly forward. Every available seat was occupied and remained occupied throughout a dramatic session that lasted until seven o'clock in the evening. The suffrage question was laboured and re-laboured. Men rose to make interminable speeches on man's God-given right to tell woman what she must and must not do. Sentimental speeches, speeches that put all womanhood to blush by the reflection of womanhood in some man's mind. They rose to speak with force and fire in an effort to make other men forsake old fashions of autocratic thought and feeling and espouse fundamental democracy. They rose to score a party advantage. They rose to points of order. They rose merely to get into the picture the congressional record. The hours were packed with incident, with suspense. The intensity of suffragists had long ago communicated itself to many House members, who by now were as strongly committed to the success of the measure as the heart of suffragists could wish. Down on the floor and out in the cloakrooms tottered men so ill that they should have been in bed, but on hand at any hazard, to vote for suffrage. Enthusiasm could not be repressed when the Republican leader, James R. Mann of Illinois, walked feebly to his seat. Everybody knew that he had left a hospital in Baltimore to answer to the suffrage roll call. Another man who was in such pain from a broken shoulder that he wandered about cloakrooms and corridors like a soul possessed was in his seat on the Democratic side, just the same when his name was called. This was the Southerner, Representative Sims of Tennessee. Another sick man, Representative Barnhart of Indiana, was brought in from a hospital bed to remain long enough to vote. Another who thrust aside illness to vote was Mr Crosser of Ohio. Still another case of suffrage loyalty that deeply moved the few who knew among the waiting women was that of Representative Hicks of New York, who came from the deathbed of his wife to cast his vote and returned home for the funeral. Down the roll call, name by name, droned the voice of the clerk. Yes, no, name by name came the answering vote. It was close indeed. Of the 410 votes polled, 274 were aye and 136 were no a two-to-one vote being necessary to carry, but it was enough. Just 40 years after the introduction of the amendment in Congress, it had gone over the top with the required two-thirds. The vote over the corridors filled with women from the galleries, relaxed, smiling, happy women. On the way to the elevators, a woman began to sing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow and the surging throng stood still to join in the expression of gratitude that was rising spontaneously from many hearts. From pillar to pillar the triumphal notes reverberated. They mounted to the dome of the old capital, a sound never heard there before. They floated out into the upper air. Many a member who had voted no was seen with hat pulled low over his eyes, listening as he hastened towards the exit perhaps comprehending that on that day a new thing had come to the nation. In that house vote was evident again the influence of the New York victory in 1917. Of the 39 New York representatives, there being four vacancies, 35 voted aye. Without New York, the vote would have been lost, and without the preceding victory in November, the aye vote of New York would have been mainly a no vote. One thing that the House debate did was to bring into sharp relief the competition by now existing between Republicans and Democrats for whatever credit and advantage should accrue from suffrage successes. A ludicrous but complicating instance of this was developed out of the National Suffrage Association's effort to express the gratitude of suffragists 
to Republicans and Democrats alike for help given. With punctilious care, letters of appreciation were sent to all the sick men who had come to the capital at such sacrifice, and a statement was issued to the press, covering a copy of the letters and mentioning by name the leaders of both parties. President Wilson, Colonel Roosevelt and others who had notably helped the suffrage cause. Thereupon the Republican papers published the letter after carefully eliminating the Democratic names. And Democratic papers published it after eliminating the Republican names. Both Republicans and Democrats forthwith angrily charged the Suffrage Association with partnership and a special call upon all the gentlemen mentioned had to be made with suitable explanations. The non-partisan attitude of the Suffrage Association never varied, but from this date forward there was continual difficulty in convincing partisans that it was not favouring their rivals. By chance on the date of the House vote, the British constitutional suffragists won their full enfranchisement through the vote of the House of Lords and cabled congratulations to their American sisters with the suggestion that January 10 be made a holiday for both countries. While the debate had been in progress in England, hundreds of women waiting in the corridors because there was no place for them within, anxiously queried each passing policeman for news. Said one of these, Lord Cromer's up, but he won't do ye much harm. In the United States there is no House of Lords, but the Senate is this nation's citadel of fixed opinion and it was Hup, and all the efforts of the suffragists, massed now on it, failed to secure a vote. Women came from all parts of the country to plead with the senators of their states. Southern women with petitions and with evidence of the popular change of sentiment in that section. Nothing availed. President Wilson attempted to influence the situation. He was supported in his effort by a number of the most influential southern newspapers. One of the publicity activities conducted for the National American Woman Suffrage Association was a department of editorial correspondence devoted to correcting the errors of editorial statements and opinion and to the conversion of newspaper editors to the Federal Suffrage Amendment. This work had borne fruit in the South as elsewhere. In September, a deputation of Southern women called upon the President and urged his more active help, and he frankly promised it. At this 11th hour, certain Democrats conceived the idea that another form of amendment might prove more acceptable to the Southern Senators, and as many sheets of paper were wasted in the attempt to write one as Charles Sumner had used in his efforts to avoid the word male in the 14th Amendment. Senator Williams of Mississippi, on June 27, proposed to make the amendments read the right of white citizens of the United States to vote, etc. Three others were proposed. The Prohibition Amendment had been submitted December 17, 1917, and the spirit of fair play was beginning to arouse widespread resentment against the discrimination shown to the Women's Amendment. Editorial writers and cartoonists put forth pungent comment worthy of the historical crisis. A national petition signed by the 1,000 best-known men in the United States, a list of imposing quality, was secured, which called forth a large number of editorials and, in printed form, was presented to senators. The date for a vote was at last set for October 1st, 1918. As the day drew near, the poll indicated that two more votes were needed and the National Suffrage Association appealed to the President. In laying the poll 62 for to 34 against before him, the appeal said, You who have proved yourself a miracle worker on many occasions may be able to produce another on Monday. The miracle of putting vision where there was none before. But the miracle was beyond the President's power to achieve, though he laboured by day and by night with Southern Democrats, urging them by letter and by interview to give way. On September 30th, he delivered in person his memorable message to the Senate, 
urging its favourable action. In part, he said, I had assumed that the Senate would concur in the amendment because no disputable principle is involved, but only a question of the method by which the suffrage is to be extended to women. There is and can be no party issue involved in it. Both of our great national parties are pledged, explicitly pledged, to equality of suffrage for the women of the country. Neither party, therefore, it seems to me, can justify hesitation as to the method of obtaining it, can rightfully hesitate to substitute federal initiative for state initiative. If the early adoption of this measure is necessary to the successful prosecution of the war, and if the method of state action proposed in the party platforms of 1916 is impracticable, within any reasonable length of time, if practical at all, and its adoption is, in my judgment, clearly necessary to the successful prosecution of the war. They, the people of Europe, are looking to the great, powerful, famous democracy of the West to lead them to the new day for which they have so long waited. And they think in their logical simplicity that democracy means that women shall play their part in affairs alongside men and upon an equal footing with them. If we reject measures like this in ignorant defiance of what a new age has brought forth, of what they have seen but we have not, they will cease to believe in us. They have seen their own governments accept this interpretation of democracy, seen old governments like that of Great Britain, which did not profess to be democratic, promise readily and take action. But October the 1st dawned, with the suffrage measure still short one vote. Responsibility for failure to get the extra vote needed was laid by each party upon the other. Friendly Republicans every day had passed the opinion to suffragists that any president can get the votes necessary to put over a question if he wants to when it lacks so few. The fact is the president is not sincere and every day friendly Democrats had expressed the conviction that the Republicans could get those needed votes if they wanted to. Their party is not opposed to federal action. The truth is the Republicans do not want the amendment to pass at all, and certainly not while Democrats are in control of the Congress, because that would be almost sure to line up the new women voters as Democrats. Those suffragists who knew just what the President was doing knew that he was not only sincere, but using the full extent of his influence with his party. On the Republican side, William Wilcox, chairman of the National Committee, went to Washington to urge the Republican minority to give way. The suffragists knew that Mr Wilcox was sincere and that the pro-suffrage Republicans were sincere. They knew that the obstacle was a minority bloc led by the Senators of Massachusetts and South Carolina. They knew that on the Republican side, the opposition would be overridden just as soon as the success of suffrage could accrue to the benefit of a Republican administration. They knew that on the Democratic side, the minority was but using the Republican opposition to protect its own deep sectional bias on the woman question and the Negro question ever looming behind the blind of the state's rights question. When on October the 1st, 1918, after five days of debate, the vote was at last taken, the amendment was defeated as expected by a vote of 62 to 34. So narrowed had the struggle become that the death of two favourable senators, one in New Hampshire and one in New Jersey, and the appointment of anti-suffrage senators to the vacancies created, caused the adverse vote. The amendment would also have passed had two Republican senators from suffrage states voted aye. One senator, Borah of Idaho, a suffragist and a Republican who clung to the state's rights method. The other, Senator Wadsworth of New York, the husband of the president of the National Association of Anti-Suffragists. Again, it might have carried if two Northern Democrats outside the state's rights area had voted aye. Senator Hitchcock of Nebraska, 
and Senator Pomerine of Ohio. But each of them represented a state wherein the controlling factor in politics, as had already been shown, was opposing woman suffrage to the bitter end. The grim facts disclosed by the vote pointed the way inexorably to a disagreeable task. If there were not men enough in the Senate who could change their minds, it had become the inescapable duty of suffragists to change the men. According to the announced agreement of the Executive Council in April, it was decided to conduct campaigns against four men in the coming autumn elections. Two were Republicans in Republican states, Senator Weeks of Massachusetts and Senator Moses of New Hampshire. One a Democrat in a Democratic state, Senator Salisbury of Delaware, and one Senator Baird, a Republican in the two-party state of New Jersey. The prospects were unpromising, as many other issues were involved in the campaign. When a representative of the National American Woman Suffrage Association announced to an executive session of the Massachusetts Suffrage Association that the only hope for the federal suffrage amendment lay in the defeat of Senator Weeks, the announcement was received with a gasp of dismay. We can never do it, the women ejaculated. He is the very heart of the Republican machine. But an anti-Weeks committee was formed and it laid before the voters his reactionary votes in the Senate. A Democrat replaced him. When the women of Delaware were told in the same way that the amendment depended upon the defeat of Senator Salisbury, they exclaimed, Impossible! He is the Democratic leader of the state and this is a Democratic state. But they began a campaign and were able to score heavily against him with the argument that he was a representative who wouldn't represent. Everybody knew that suffragists had made a town-to-town canvas in Delaware before the United States Senate vote in October to secure signatures to a petition to Senator Salisbury and Walcott asking their support for the amendment and knew too that 11,111 signatures had been obtained and everybody knew too that though this petition was enormous for a state of three counties only, it had had no appreciable effect, for both senators had voted no. Delawareans showed their resentment of this fact by voting to put Mr Salisbury's rival in at Washington. In New Jersey, Mr Baird was re-elected with a much reduced majority, and in New Hampshire, where large Republican majorities are usual, Mr Moses was elected with only 1,200 majority. The success of the amendment in the 66th Senate was assured. Provided death or disaster did not take away a friend, for there was not a vote to spare. But the suffragists decided to try for earlier action without waiting for the convening of the 66th Congress. The chairman of the suffrage committee, Senator A. A. Jones of New Mexico, had changed his vote on October the 1st from yes to no in order to move a reconsideration so that the way was clear for another chance with the 65th Congress still in session. All the clearer because the large vote of women in the November elections had so impressed political leaders that it was hoped that two men in the 65th might be in repentant mood and change their vote on reconsideration. Many additional events had strengthened the suffrage position. In the elections of the year, over 40,000 women in Arkansas and 386,000 women in Texas had voted in the primaries. This showing, surprising to the South, had been achieved despite the fact that the women of Arkansas had voluntarily paid a poll tax to gain the privilege and that the women of Texas had had but 17 days in which to register. Ex-Governor Ferguson, who had presented the Minority Resolutions Report in the 1916 National Democratic Convention, had been effectively disposed of at the Texas polls and the women's vote was credited with this result. In New York, where women went to the polls for the first time, the estimated number of women voters was 1 million and the November press recorded a large vote of women in all states.
The 1918 elections had also brought three more states into the full suffrage list. Michigan, South Dakota and Oklahoma, the last a section of former slave territory. The Vermont legislator had broken the record of New England's state conservatism by extending the municipal vote to women in 1917. The legislators of North Dakota, Michigan, Nebraska and Rhode Island in 1917 had extended presidential suffrage to their women and in 1919, Indiana and Missouri had followed suit. The managers of political parties were finding a vexatious situation in the task put upon them of enlisting and organising the new voters in these states, while men and women were charging each party with responsibility for the failure to secure the vote for the women of all states. End of chapter 21, part 1Chapter 21, Part 2 of Woman Suffrage and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. Woman Suffrage and Politics The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Shuler. Chapter 21, Part 2 The Congress of the United States Surrenders Large honorary committees of prominent men, including many contributors and workers in party campaigns, had been organised and were compelling party leaders to sense the responsibility for delay. These leaders were nettled by the senatorial impasse and far more actively interested than ever before. On February the 11th, 1918, the Democratic National Committee, and on February the 12th, the Republican National Committee, had resolved for the passage of the amendment. Through the spring and summer, this action had been seconded by the action of many state party conventions and by the congressional committees of both parties. So the two national party chairmen and their immediate predecessors all went to Washington to labour with their respective minorities. At last the women heard the cracking of the party whip. For their own part, the suffragists were leaving no stone unturned in the search for the needed votes. Both the hopeful and the doubtful senators were being bombarded with home petitions, letters and telegrams. Deputations of women and men called upon them. The daily telegrams carefully listed on disconcertingly long sheets of paper were laid by secretaries on their desk. Scrapbooks in which were neatly pasted the favourable editorials from the state press were handed to them. Public opinion was vastly on the side of action by the Senate, so it seemed not too much to expect that at least two senators would yield their obstinacy to the overwhelming public demand. The details of one campaign to secure a senatorial vote are worthy of record, since it was typical of many like efforts to lose women's suffrage in a thicket of conditions. When Senator Gallinger of New Hampshire died, an amendment vote and a working friend were lost. The Republican governor was urged by the National Republican chairman to appoint a man to the vacancy who would vote for the amendment. The national and state suffragists supported this request by earnest and continued effort while Senators Lodge and Weeks of Massachusetts made appeals for an appointee who would vote against suffrage, and were probably supported by those mysterious forces which had long controlled politics in New Hampshire. Mr Drew was appointed ad interim and was polled in opposition. Mr Moses had been elected at the next election and had voted against the amendment on October the 1st. Immediately after his election, a Republican woman was sent to interview him. The campaign against him had not left him pleasantly disposed towards suffragists, but he was made to understand that the women's opposition had been directed toward his suffrage attitude only. 
He promised the interviewer to support the amendment should he be asked to do so by a resolution of his legislator. As the New Hampshire legislature would not convene before January 1919, the National Suffrage Association proposed a still stronger mandate and sent three workers into the state, who with New Hampshire women made a canvas of the legislators in their own homes for signatures to a petition to Senator Moses. The legislature is the largest in the United States, 426 members although the Senate is small. The signatures of two-thirds of the total membership were secured as petitioning Senator Moses to vote for the federal suffrage amendment and a deputation of suffragists took the petition to Washington, emphasising the fact that a resolution required only a majority vote, whereas the petition carried the names of two-thirds of the legislator. Senator Moses made reply that the petition would not serve the purpose expected and that he would insist upon the resolution. The legislature met the first week in January, and a public hearing before both houses was granted to suffragists, after which, by a majority of 74, the House passed the resolution, endorsing the passage of the Federal Suffrage Amendment. The legislature then adjourned for the weekend. A hasty poll was made by personal interview with the state senators, to make assurance doubly sure, and found the majority standing firm for the resolution. Andrew J. Hook, a senator who had not been interviewed when the petition to Senator Moses had been in circulation, now said he would vote for the resolution if the women could bring him a petition from a majority of the members of the Republican town committees in his district asking him to do so. There was but a single day in which to do this work and there were ten towns to be covered, but it was done. The petition was presented to Senator Hook on January the 14th, when the legislature again convened. The resolution came up at once, and was disposed of by a vote of six ayes and fifteen nays. Mr Hook voted no. An explanation of the way his mind worked was later revealed. After stipulating that he must have a petition from his district, he had gone to the suffrage headquarters and had said that if the women could get 12 senators to vote for the resolution, he would make the 13th. The women replied that the majority was already pledged and that they were already at work upon the petition he requested. When Senator Moses received the news of the action taken by the House, he had hastened to Concord to confer with senators, apparently to urge them to save him from his rash promise and when the legislature reconvened, three of the most powerful lobbyists of the state were in Concord and at work against the resolution. Mr Hook, learning that enough men had been induced to fall from the poll so that 12 men would not vote for the resolution, ignored his first proposal, never withdrawn and fulfilled with all conditions by the suffragists, and remembered only the second. Thus may a politician emerge from under a broken pledge with honour intact. A group of New Hampshire senators explained to a representative of the Manchester Union leader why they had broken their agreements, which they readily acknowledged they had done. They had agreed, they said, to vote for the petition in the full belief that it would be killed in the House, where it was likely to come up first and therefore would never reach them. But one senator had added... You can't depend on this house. It is liable to do most anything. While this campaign was in progress, a letter appeared in the New Hampshire press declaring that the National Republican Committee had no right to dictate to senators how they should vote. It was signed by Senator Wadsworth of New York, who had actively and continuously sought to prevent a favourable vote on suffrage by the Federal House and Senate. On January the 3rd, Two days before his death, Colonel Roosevelt had written Senator Moses a letter in which he said, I earnestly hope you will see your way clear to support the national amendment. It is coming anyhow and it ought to come. When states like New York and Illinois adopt it, it can't be called a wildcat experiment. Mr Moses considered his opposed attitude justified by the failure of the New Hampshire Senate to concur in the House resolution 
overlooking the discreditable process of securing that result. Once again, the suffragists asked the perennial and always unanswerable question. Why do men repudiate ordinary principles of honour in United States politics when to do so in business and private life would make them outcasts from all contact with decent people? This New Hampshire experience is illustrative of American legislative history rather than the record of an exceptional case. Slippery politicians has become, in consequence of custom, a term of good usage in political vocabularies. In the general result, the November elections changed the control of the Congress from Democratic to Republican. Americans, with their habit of finding the solution of political and economic problems by oscillation between the two major parties and being hard-pressed by the aftermath of war, had repudiated the Democratic Party at the polls, so that while the 65th Congress had been Democratic, the 66th was to be Republican. The Democrats, who were friendly to suffrage, realising that the Republican Congress would submit the suffrage amendment and thus win the loyalty of unknown numbers of new voters, now made desperate attempts to pass the measure before the session should close and put an end to the 65th Congress. Open and private letters to senators were sent by members of the Democratic Cabinet. Several caucuses of friendly Democrats were held to try some new approach to gain the needed two votes. There were similar conferences of friendly Republicans. On December the 2nd, on the eve of his sailing for Europe for the peace conference, President Wilson addressed a joint session of the Congress and included in it another earnest appeal to pass the federal suffrage amendment. On December the 8th, the National Suffrage Association held a woman war workers mass meeting in Washington, from which hundreds were turned away for lack of room, and an overflow meeting was held. At both meetings, resolutions urging the submission of the amendment were adopted and a copy was presented to each senator. The date of February the 10th was at last fixed for the vote on reconsideration and the amendment was lost by a single vote, the record standing 63 to 33. Not a senator had changed. The gain of one vote had come through the appointment of William P. Pollock of South Carolina to a vacancy. He accepted the president's advice and not only voted for the amendment but spoke for it a fact which threw his state into an uproar of controversy in which abuse was more often heaped upon him than praise. Twenty states cast all their votes in Senate and House in favour, and three, Alabama, Delaware and Georgia, all their votes in both Senate and House against the amendment. Only three senators west of the Mississippi River voted against. Borah of Idaho, Reed of Missouri, and Hitchcock of Nebraska. Both senators in nine states voted against the amendment. Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, Florida, Georgia and Alabama. New York suffragists felt keenly that the one lacking from their majority was their Senator Wadsworth. And what is a representative for, if not to represent, they asked. And what constitutes a mandate from a constituency? By a majority of more than 100,000, the state had enfranchised its women in November 1917. In the winter of 1918, the legislator had called upon him by resolution to vote for the measure. In September 1918, his party, meeting in state convention, had called upon him to vote for the amendment and he was himself a member of the Resolutions Committee, which presented the resolution. This action had been taken at the request of a majority of the Republican County Conventions of the state. In 1918, the National Republican Committee, by resolution, had called upon him and other senators to vote for the measure, and in 1919, his legislator had again called upon him to support the amendment. Women knew of no stronger expression of public demand that could be made. 
turning to history, they found no mandate so complete given to any congressman at any time to persuade him to sacrifice his individual inclination to the public demand. Following the vote, the woman citizen, in an editorial entitled They Shall Not Pass, said men come and men go, but a truth goes marching on. Not a banner will be filled, not a marcher will break step, not a friend will desert, not a political party will falter, not a newspaper will lapse into silence. All the way down the lines leading from Washington to New England, to the solid south and to the great west, those with ears to the ground will hear the tramp, tramp of millions of feet responding to the call. Forward, forward march. And there will be men's feet, women's feet, soldiers' feet and children's feet in that mighty tramp. It is the tramp of the people. They shall not pass. They shall pass and soon. The amendment having been voted down could not again come before the 65th Senate. But Democrats convinced that the failure of the Democratic Senate to pass the amendment would prove a handicap in the coming election, were unwilling to give up. A serious effort was made to devise a slightly different form of the amendment, which would not only win the one vote needed, but allow consideration. Men and women from the South went to Washington and attempted to unite their party senators upon such an amendment. Most of the forms drawn were unacceptable to the suffragists, but one was finally approved. Two senators of the opposition agreed to vote for it, and the two-thirds vote was therefore assured. The resolution was introduced and referred to the Suffrage Committee, where a favourable report was promptly secured. The end of the session was approaching, and owing to senatorial procedure, in the closing days unanimous consent was necessary to get the favourable report upon the calendar. Most, if not all, the Democratic opponents agreed to make no objection to unanimous consent. Optimistic Democrats claimed that a large additional Southern vote would be secured should the amendment come to vote, since the proposal was certain to pass. To this optimism was opposed the assurance of hostile Republican senators that the House had agreed to find objection to the new form and would not agree to the amendment even though the Senate should pass it. They further declared that there was no assurance that a suffrage amendment would ever pass. Since House leaders had also agreed not to allow any form of the amendment to pass the 66th Congress, even though such provision should pass the Senate. Both claims were false and in any event there were votes enough to pass the new amendment in the 65th Senate. The chairman of the Senate committee was on watch day and night to find opportunity to ask unanimous consent for the presentation of the favourable report. At this point it was observed by many friends of the measure that Senators Wadsworth and Weeks spelled each other in a vigil so that one or the other could always be present to object whenever consent should be asked. This small incident aroused much additional acrimony, the friendly Democrats again contending that the Northern opposed senators were merely postponing action in order to throw to the Republicans whatever political credit might accrue from the passage of the amendment in the 66th Congress and Republican senators accusing the Democrats of attempting to cover their years of opposition to federal suffrage action by the appearance of support at the 11th hour. Both accusations contained much truth, and the sorry fact was that the 65th Congress adjourned with the amendment not yet submitted. From one of the earliest ships to bring soldiers from France, a lively boy soldier ran down the gangplank ahead of his fellows and astounded the group of women waiting to serve coffee and sandwiches with the excited question, Have you got it yet? Got what? they inquired. Why the vote? he answered. Not yet, replied the women. Whereupon the young patriot ejaculated in a tone of scorn. Oh, hang! You ought to be ashamed. The German women have it. The more intelligent people of America had come to much the same opinion. The President's war message to the Congress and the 100 congressional speeches that followed had implied that entrance into the World War 
was necessary to prevent the recrudescence of an autocracy-ruled world. Making the world safe for democracy had become the text of sermons, speeches and appeals pronounced on behalf of conscription, food conservation, extra production, liberty loans and loyalty pledges. Though an American ambassador said to an English audience in 1921 that the United States had gone to war to save its own skin, this was not the interpretation given in the midst of the contest. On the contrary, the moral aims of the war were more and more stressed in all the Allied nations as the campaign to uphold the home defences proceeded. The leaders everywhere seemed in accord with General Smuts of South Africa when he said that the war was a great crusade for human liberty. It began, said he, as a great military war, but all that has happened has transformed it into a great moral and spiritual crusade. During the years of the war, the story of the unexpected and heroic services of women had been inextricably interwoven with all reports of the war for democracy. Mr Balfour said in the United States, behind every man in the trenches, there are 10 persons making it possible for him to stay there. In 1917, seven of the 10 were women. General Joffre said, we have two armies, one in the trenches and one behind the trenches. The one in the rear is composed largely of women. In the United States, the women were not lagging behind those of Europe in heroic war services. A woman's council of defence, with Dr Anna Howard Shaw as chairman, had united the women of the nation in the home defence work and various organisations were sending hundreds of women overseas. The National Suffrage Association was itself maintaining a hospital in France. It was after the women of Great Britain, Canada, Germany and many other countries had been enfranchised that the Senate, on February the 10th, 1919, again refused to allow the federal suffrage amendment to go to the legislators. The contrasting generosity of the British Parliament had been shown January the 4th, 1919, when, in 78 minutes, it passed a bill of 78 words, making women eligible to sit in the House of Commons. American leaders of both political parties were by then battling hard with their respective reactionary minorities for it was by then clear that there might be an enormous advantage accruing to the party that should finally enfranchise women. The spirit of these leaders had come to resemble that of an omnibus conductor in London during one of the great suffrage processions. After a vain attempt to make headway through the surging crowds, he shouted, Oh, sigh, give women the vote and let's get on with the traffic. The armistice came, bloodless revolutions erected republics where Kaiser and Emperor had once reigned, and elections were held for Reichstag and state assemblies in which all men and all women were permitted to participate. The press carried the news to the farthest corners of the earth that millions of German women had not only voted, but that 30 had been elected to the Reichstag. This was the spirit and these the events of the world while in the United States, the willful 33, as the press quite generally designated that bipartisan minority of the 65th Congress, refused to budge. They showed no comprehension of the changed thought of the world, nor were they characterised by that party loyalty, which demands that men yield personal prejudice to the superior claim of party advantage. In accordance with the plan adopted in 1916 at the Atlantic City Convention, the National American Woman Suffrage Association State Auxiliaries had continued hard at work during the winter of 1919 and before the end of the legislative session, 24 state legislators had petitioned Congress to pass the Federal Suffrage Amendment and five of these, New York, Idaho, Nebraska, Ohio and Missouri had called upon an opposed senator to change his vote. Before May the 1st 1919 the number of states in which presidential suffrage had been extended was 14. One of these, Michigan, 
had entered the full suffrage list in 1918, and in one, Vermont, the governor had vetoed the presidential suffrage bill. Inclusive of Arkansas and Texas, where women had the right to vote in the primaries, women would vote for presidential electors in 30 states, a fact which was still proving the most persuasive of all arguments for extending full suffrage to women in all states. The President called a special session of the new Congress to meet May 19, 1919. On May the 21st, he addressed it and again recommended the passage of the Federal Suffrage Amendment. The amendment was introduced by six members in the House, promptly reported by the Suffrage Committee on the 20th and placed on the calendar for the 21st. James R. Mann was now the chairman of the Suffrage Committee in the House and to his organising abilities, the quick work of getting the vote was due. The amendment was brought up almost immediately on the 21st and after two hours of discussion, it was passed by a vote of 304 ayes, of which 200 were Republicans, 102 Democrats, one Prohibitionist, one Independent, 89 nays, of which 19 were Republicans and 70 were Democrats. 42 votes more than the required two-thirds had been secured. 71 of the affirmative votes were cast by representatives from the southern states. The Democrats polled 54% of their membership, the Republicans 84% of theirs for the amendment. Of 117 new members elected in November, 103 voted for the amendment. 15 returned members changed from negative to affirmative and no affirmative change to negative. The Democratic National Committee not waiting for the Senate to act, called on the legislators of the various states to meet in special session and ratify the amendment. On June the 4th, 1919, after a two days debate, the measure again came to vote in the United States Senate. Four amendments were submitted, all by Southern Democrats, for the obvious purpose of securing delay. One by Senator Underwood of Alabama, proposed to refer the ratification of the amendment to state conventions. One amendment to this amendment was offered by Senator Phelan of California, defining the character of such conventions. One was proposed by Senator Harrison of Mississippi, introducing the word white as defining citizens. One by Senator Gay of Louisiana, providing that enforcement of the amendment be left to the states. All were lost. Three times the galleries violated the rule against demonstrations. There was applause when Senator Spencer of Missouri defended Missouri suffrage sentiment against his senior colleague, Senator Reed. Laughter when Senator Underwood, who shared dishonour with Senator Reed as the chief obstructionist in the debate, absent mindedly gave a loud eye when his name was called on the main amendment, and then hastily changed to no. And a great wave of rejoicing when from the chair, the voice of the presiding officer, Senator Cummins, rang out more clearly than the galleries had ever heard as he announced the victory. 66 senators had voted aye, 30 had voted no. The crowds of women issuing from the Senate chamber that day did not sing as they had done on January the 10th, 1918 the day the amendment had first passed the House. To their weary senses, the only meaning of the vote just taken was that the Senate had at last surrendered, given over its stubborn resistance, given in to the people it represented. The eyes were the eyes of Congress, but the voice was the voice of the people. That afternoon, in the presence of representatives of the National Suffrage Association and many friendly senators, Speaker Gillette and, on the following day, Vice President Marshall signed the Federal Suffrage Amendment with a gold pen, christened the Victory Pen, now in the archives of the National American Woman Suffrage Association at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. I join with you and all friends of the suffrage cause 
in rejoicing over the adoption of the suffrage amendments by the Congress. Please accept and convey to your association my warmest congratulations, cabled President Wilson from Paris. A parting reception was held at the big suffrage house before it was closed forever as a suffrage headquarters. The thanks to men who had helped were spoken and many a hearty hand clasp of suffrage workers and faithful friends in the Congress marched the close of the long battle. The association thanked the political parties for their help and asked the continuance of their support. The parties congratulated the association and promised that support. Only a few weeks earlier, the Suffrage Association had finished with state referenda. Almost coincidentally, it had come to the end of its work with the Congress. It faced now a new era of suffrage work, the work for ratification. End of chapter 21, part 2「Chapter 22 of Women's Suffrage and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Women's Suffrage and Politics. The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Roger Schuler. Chapter 22. Campaigning for Ratification. Long before the Federal Suffrage Amendment passed the Congress, the National American Women's Suffrage Association had its ratification campaign formulated to the last detail. Every legislator had been polled, governors had been interviewed, the press kept informed of the necessary procedure of the campaign, and an expectant, eager army, thoroughly well-equipped and trained, was waiting for the next move. Before the sun set on June 4th, telegrams had been sent to all governors where special legislative sessions would be necessary, urging that such sessions be called. Instructions for still more intensive campaigns with governors, legislators, and the press were wired to state auxiliaries to the National Suffrage Association, and when the sun rose on June 5th, the campaign was already under full speed. The situation was complicated by the fact that only six state legislators meet annually, those of New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, South Carolina, and Georgia, and these with five others, Kentucky, Virginia, Maryland, Louisiana, and Mississippi, whose regular sessions would be held in 1920, were the only ones that would have an opportunity to take action before the presidential election of 1920, unless it were possible to catch legislators before adjournment in some states and to secure extra sessions in others. The response to the National Suffrage Association's effort to catch these adjourning legislatures and to secure the extra sessions was immediate and, to the uninitiated, of happiest augury for quick and complete success. All the next day, and for many days to come, telegrams poured into the association's office from governors. The first answers were from Alfred E. Smith, Democratic Governor of New York, and Henry J. Allen, Republican Governor of Kansas. Fourteen governors answered yes definitely, and several others answered that they would call special sessions provided a sufficient number of other governors would do so. Thereupon, the National Suffrage Association on June 9th sent telegrams to 24 governors which read, Ten state legislatures, now in session or meeting in called session, are expected to ratify the Federal Suffrage Amendment. Four meeting January 1920 are certain to do so. Would you be willing to agree to be one of 22 governors to call a special session in order to complete ratification before presidential election? This telegram brought immediate answers from several governors pledging special sessions and on June 10th came the first ratification. The legislatures of Illinois and Wisconsin being on the eve of adjournment, the suffrage amendment was wired to both from Washington for ratification. Thereupon, started a lively contest between the two states for first place. Illinois newspapers helped by calling loudly upon the legislature to be first. Her governor, Frank O. Loudon, helped by sending a spirited message to the legislature. And her assembly helped by introducing into the Senate a resolution for ratification 24 hours after the passage of the amendment and before the receipt of the official notification. Action was taken on June 10th. 
two letters in the alphabet came near losing Illinois first place. A sentence in the joint resolution transmitted from the Federal Secretary of State's office to the Illinois governor read, which shall be valid for all events and purposes as part of the Constitution. Events should have been intense. Legal authorities said that ratification was not invalidated, but to be safe, the Illinois legislature re-ratified June 17th. Wisconsin ratified on the same day, in spite of Senator Herman Bilgren, who, for reasons good and sufficient, to himself voted no. Pressed for these reasons by reporters, he objected to telling them because he feared that he would not be quoted correctly, so he carefully wrote out a statement which was carefully printed in the Wisconsin State Journal Thursday, June 12, 1919, and is carefully reproduced below. Why I Voted Against Women's Suff I and my wife agree on point one. A housewife belongs to home, near her children, and to keep house, and not in open public politic. Second, it is only for the city women in larger cities that want to vote and to get the control of the country vote. To elect state officers and president of the U.S. because a country woman won't not go to vote. They have all they want to do to take care of their children and housework, garden, and etc. Third, a danger that the men will not go to the polls if the women get elected to any state legislature. The big danger will be that some hair polling will going on if there will be women elected in the state legislature. They will be worse as the attorneys at present. The classic quality of the Bill Grant argument was not lost on the general public, which gasped with surprise at this evidence that such a grade of male intelligence and literacy should be allowed to sit in high places and pass judgment on women of brains and culture in their appeal for justice. There was no surprise in it, only grim humor for suffragists. They had had to present their case before the tribunal of just such a grade of intelligence and literacy all too often. The gallant competition for first place between Illinois and Wisconsin led a Wisconsin officer of the National Suffrage Association to obtain an appointment from the Wisconsin governor for ex-senator David G. James, an old-time suffragist, to carry Wisconsin ratification in person to Washington. Mr. James allowed himself to be pressed into the service, rushed out to buy extra clothing, arranged his business over the telephone, and left on the first train. Thus, Wisconsin had the distinction of filing her certificate first. Commenting on the ratification, the Wisconsin State Journal said, This legislature is free, at least, which is something that cannot be said of all former sessions. For many years, the brewers of Wisconsin were the political power in the state, and the brewers of Wisconsin would not have allowed the ratification of the Equal Suffrage Amendment. Michigan was the third state to ratify, Kansas the next, then Ohio, then New York, each ratification having some drama of its own, and all being received with loud acclaim by the public. New York might reasonably have offered an excuse for delay in ratifying, inasmuch as its legislature was to meet in regular session in January 1920, but Governor Alfred E. Smith called the legislature in special session June 16th. After the assembly had approved the amendment unanimously, Mrs. Ida Samus and Mrs. Mary B. Lilly, Republican and Democratic Assemblywomen, respectively, were appointed to carry the notification to the Senate an event unprecedented in the history of New York State. In three and one-half hours, the historic scene was over. In both houses, action was unanimous. Six ratifications had now taken place in as many days. The state auxiliaries of the National Suffrage Association continued to send delegations to their governors with appeals for ratification, and the association itself continued to press for more and still more special sessions. After consulting with the representatives of the National Suffrage Association, four state governors sent letters to all other governors to suggest unity of action. The four were Governors J. A. A. Bernquist, Minnesota, Samuel B. McLevy, Nebraska, James E. Goodrich, Indiana, and William D. Stevens, California.
The results of these polls were sent later to the National Suffrage Association's office. Governor Bernquist reported 28 favorable replies. In the meantime, the legislators of three states in regular session, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and Texas, ratified, and special sessions with ratification followed in Iowa and Missouri. In Pennsylvania, the ratification was greatly forwarded by the steadfastly favorable attitude of Governor Sproul, Republican. In his inaugural address, he said that he would be gratified and proud if the state should be among the first to ratify, and it was very generally alleged that had it not been for his determined action, which compelled party leaders to respect their promises, the General Assembly, inherently hostile to women's suffrage, never would have gone on record for ratification. Pennsylvania's ratification campaign was marked, too, by the withdrawal of U.S. Senator Boyce Penrose from the active opposition. True, he took his time to get out of the way and sidetracked all appeals until he could go fishing. Evidently, the fishing was good, for get out of the way he did. With the ban of the Penrose influence lifted, the joint resolution passed the Pennsylvania Senate on June 24th, was rushed to the House referred to the Judiciary Special Committee and in less than three minutes reported out by a vote of 16 to 1. Speeches occupied three quarters of an hour. Then came the roll call. Halfway through, the women who were polling said, we have enough votes now. Before the speaker could announce the results, one enthusiastic legislator leaped to his feet and shouted, it's gone over, Mr. Speaker, it's gone over, whereupon the men burst into song. Then the House took occasion to express its appreciation of the Pennsylvania State Suffrage Association, state auxiliary to the National American Women Suffrage Association, and to credit the victory to its tactics and personnel. The state president was given opportunity to address the House from the Speaker's rostrum, the first time in Pennsylvania's history that the honor had been accorded to a woman. Perhaps no ratification aroused more rejoicing among suffragists than the victory in rock-ribbed Old Massachusetts, the state where the first shot was fired in the revolution against taxation without representation. The first state to send a regiment to the front in the Civil War and a fully equipped regiment to Europe in the World War. The home of the oldest and strongest anti-suffrage association in the United States, whose workers had been sent all over the country to flood it with misleading literature. The birthplace of Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony, the seat of the first National Women's Rights Convention in 1850, an eighth state to ratify the federal suffrage amendment. In Texas, first among southern or southwestern states to ratify, filibustering, threats, heckling, fervid oratory on women's fear, and women antis were used by the opposition in every conceivable way to defeat, deflect, or delay the ratification. In vain, the suffrage men stood firm, a concurrent resolution providing that the members of the Senate and House resign immediately and go before the voters for re-election in order to obtain an expression on the question was referred to committee. Suffrage gained votes in the Senate with every substitute proposal. Finally, the effort to defeat ratification became so vehement that six senators agreed to resign if ten more would do so, sixteen defalcations being necessary to break the quorum. That failed. Then, on voting to pass the resolution to third reading three senators, Alderdice, Souter, and Wood changed their vote from no to yes. The opposition was broken and Texas ratified. Immediately after the ratification, one of the bitterest of wet and dry fights was precipitated in Texas. The impeached ex-governor, James E. Ferguson, against whom the women had voted in the primary election, aided by the WETS, organized an anti-suffrage association. They began their work in the courts and attacked the primary law. Losing in the first decision, they announced their aim to prevent ratification in 36 states until after the next regular session of the Texas legislature in 1921. Meanwhile, they intended to make it an issue and elect an anti-suffrage legislature which would repeal the ratification just secured. In Iowa, 
Governor William L. Harding called the legislature in special session on July 2nd for the sole purpose of ratifying the federal suffrage amendment. The legislature convened at 10 a.m. at 1140. The resolution had passed both houses and the struggle begun in Iowa in 1868 was triumphantly finished. In Missouri, the opposition to a special session, which at first seemed formidable, soon melted away, and both the representative who had called the movement bunk and the other who had favored giving women the mallet instead of the ballot found themselves sitting in their respective places one hot day, July 2nd, listening to the reading of the Governor Frederick D. Gardner's message, which closed with the words, I entertain an abiding faith that you will give the subject favorable consideration. The governor's faith was justified. Early in the poll, it was seen that the eyes would have it. It was Charles P. Comer, an especially vehement opponent, who gave the key to the situation after going on record with his eye. I've played poker long enough to know when to lay down my hand, said he. Eleven states had now ratified within one month. While not quite one-fourth of the United States or one-third of the number required to ratify the amendment, these states contained more than one-half the population of the whole country. The group included every large state entitled to 18 or more presidential electors in the Electoral College. The amendment had therefore a clear majority of the American people in its favor, as attested by the ratifying votes of their representative bodies, a fact that went far to lay low the charge, still made by the opposition that a small minority was seeking to impose its will on a large majority of the people. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of Woman, Suffrage, and Politics this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Woman Suffrage and Politics, The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler. Hard Work for Special Sessions there followed next a discouraging phase of the campaign due to the failure of Western governors to call special sessions. Not a state in the far West had ratified. The National American Woman Suffrage Association's plan had been rapid action by Western full suffrage states first, ratification by the partial suffrage states second, and a concentration of forces on the Eastern states last, where women were not yet political factors. Western governors and suffrage organizations, fully understanding the plan, had agreed to cooperate in carrying it out, but it was the East that took action first, while the West, instead of quick action, betrayed a baffling hesitation to act at all. Delays, excuses, and messages not easy to understand were the only explanations offered. In July 1919, four envoys were sent out from the National Suffrage Association, two to visit the Republican states of Minnesota, North Dakota, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Wyoming, and the other two to the Democratic states of Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Oklahoma. The mission of the envoys was to investigate the local political situation as it affected the call of a special session, to arouse favorable sentiment among politicians, editors, and the people generally, and to secure definite statements from the Western governors as to the conditions under which the legislatures could be called and the probable date of calling. The Northern envoys followed Governor Burnquist across the entire state of Minnesota, the governor, finally, by riding four miles bareback and thirty-six miles in a car from his ranch to a little town, met them and gave his pledge to call a session in September. The southern envoys, learning that Thomas E. Campbell, governor of Arizona, was on a speaking trip and would not return to Phoenix until September, secured his itinerary and, in spite of assurances that they could never overtake him, surprised him in a country hotel at Flagstaff, where they secured a pledge for a session. Women in the enfranchised states had been absorbed into the political parties and, with their suffrage campaign organizations practically dissolved, were in no position to carry out independent political action. They counseled patience when governors replied, The women of my state have the suffrage. It will not help us. Or, An extra session will be too costly, although these reasons were serving to cloak the real motive, which, in many cases, were petty politics. 
In some states, the governor was of one party, the legislature of another, and the several governors hesitated to call special sessions for fear such sessions might give a chance for discussion which would affect their candidacy or be harmful to their party in the coming November election. Two governors, one a Republican and one a Democrat, had been threatened by factions of their own party with impeachment if their legislatures were called. After initiating various plans to secure sessions, the four envoys met in Salt Lake City, where the annual conference of governors was called for August 18 to 24, 1919. The formal appeal of the National Suffrage Association to the conference was delivered by the envoys and concluded as follows, quote, All that is required is early action in the 14 favorable western states. The West controls the fate of the campaign entirely. Upon the date of its action depends the date of completed ratification. The National American Women's Suffrage Association implores the governors of the West in conference assembled to find some ground of common agreement so that the ratification of their legislatures may be secured in the months of September or October and thus ensure final ratification by February 1st." End quote. In response, several governors publicly restated pledges they had made privately to the envoys. On August 21st, the following telegram was sent to National Suffrage Headquarters signed by the four envoys. Quote, Republican governors in conference this afternoon declared in favor of special sessions to ratify the suffrage amendment so that women may vote in 1920. Unquote. Public pledges were brought back from seven governors and confidential pledges from three. But while several governors were taking favorable action, one governor, Ruffin G. Pleasant of Louisiana, was making an effort to secure a union of 13 states to prevent ratification. He asked southern governors to join an alliance to demand that suffrage be gained by state action. This in face of the fact that suffragists had conducted weary campaigns for many years with the aim of securing state action, and had met with such stolid opposition that it had become necessary to resort to the only other method, a federal amendment. Governors C. H. Bro of Arkansas, James D. Black of Kentucky, Sidney J. Katz of Florida, and Theodore Bilbo of Mississippi publicly declined the invitation. If any such compact was effected, it was never made public. Meantime, a special session of the Arkansas legislature had been called for July 28. As in Texas, so in Arkansas, the prejudices of the South were violently played upon by the opposition. A woman, Auntie, from Yonkers, New York, was imported to explain Southern traditions to Southerners, and the bogey of Negro domination was kept on constant parade. Legislative debate brought into glaring relief the struggle between old-time Southern prejudice and the new spirit of Southern progressiveness. Quote, I'd rather see my daughter in her coffin than at the polls, end quote, declaimed one legislator. Whereupon another rose to point out that in the estimation of that self-same tenderly protective father, cattle ranked far ahead of daughters, for he had voted for $100,000 appropriation with which to fight ticks from the backs of Arkansas cattle and refused to vote one penny for the maintenance of an industrial school for Arkansas girls. The debate served also to bring into high relief the fact that, as in the far south, also in Arkansas, a border state, Negro suffrage, the bogey, keeps Negro suffrage as a practice non-existent. Said one senator, quote, If this amendment is ratified, there will be a domination of Negro rule in the south. Time will come when the people will wake up and find that women should not be enfranchised, unquote. Said another, We'll attend to the Negro vote, all right said the first senator, you say you'll attend to the Negro vote. Well, how are you going to do it? Said the second, well, there may be several ways. I remember one time I was in charge of a ballot box in which there were 319 Negro and only 17 white men's votes. I was riding mule back. Just as I got about in the middle of the bridge while crossing a creek, my mule suddenly became frightened, pitched me off, and I accidentally let the ballot box drop into the creek. Neither the box nor the votes have ever been seen since. End quote. But neither the specter of Negro rule nor the fear of contaminating women at the polls sufficed in the final analysis to stop the Arkansas legislature. The long hard work of Arkansas suffragists reaped its reward in ratification.
The last days of July 1919 proved a fecund season for ratifications. Besides Arkansas, two other states ratified. One was Nebraska, a state where the liquor interests had long made the suffrage going hard in the extreme. The other was Montana, first of the farther west to get into line. Note. In December 1919, the convention that was to rewrite the Nebraska Constitution met in Lincoln. It was provided that women should vote on the acceptance of the amended Constitution and that a full suffrage clause, which was inserted, should go into effect as soon as the adoption of the Constitution was announced by the governor. Before the vote was taken on the Constitution, September 21, 1920, the federal suffrage amendment had been ratified. Thus Nebraska women, enfranchised by the federal amendment, went to the polls and voted on their own state enfranchisement. With their votes, the Constitution received 65,483 eyes to 15,416 nays. End of note. I shall be disappointed if the vote is not unanimous, said Nebraska's governor to Nebraska's legislature. The vote was unanimous. The Joint Judiciary Committee decided to put the resolution through with the same procedure as a bill in order that no attack could be made upon its validity. This action required five days. By invitation, the President of the State Auxiliary to the National American Woman Suffrage Association addressed both houses. An interesting feature was the transmission of the resolution from the Senate to the House by Miss Schenck, the first woman who had ever served as Assistant Secretary of the Senate in Nebraska came a lull through August. Then the September ratifications took the stage. Minnesota was first, and its legislature wound up the task dramatically by singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. New Hampshire came next. In the latter state, there had been only two special sessions in 66 years, and none at all for 29 years. And to many minds, that is always a cogent argument for not having any at all, whatever the proposition, for 29 more years. So extreme and so curiously stressed was the opposition that Governor Bartlett made occasion to write, quote, It is said that if I dare call the legislature together with the consent of counsel, they, the ring, will flay me alive, kill every reform measure passed last winter, the trustee bill, the school bill, and so on. This is silly. I will risk all dangers that may come to me. Let us come together briefly and keep our pledges to give women the ballot. No political or bodily fear will stop me for one second. End quote. Note, the governor and a council of five in New Hampshire have full power to call a special session at any time, if the welfare of the state should require the same. The special session was duly called for September 9th, and the legislature duly ratified on that date. Another lull, and then Utah swung into line on September 30th with a unanimous ratification. During the passage of the resolution in the House, Assemblywoman Anna T. Pearson was in the chair. At this point, ratification seemed to reach a veritable impasse. An inexplicable situation was presented. The West was still strangely hesitant. The political battlefront had shifted from the east, where most opposition had been expected, to the Pacific coast, where none had been anticipated. Seventeen states had ratified. Eleven, having full suffrage in the far west, had not called their sessions, although, with the exception of Oklahoma and Oregon, all had agreed to do so. Never in the history of the country was the provincialism of the states more apparent. In popular estimate, the question of ratification seemed bounded by state lines, and there was little national point of view. Said the Press of Oregon, quote, Oregon has sympathetic interest in ratification of the National Equal Suffrage Amendment, but it is a detached interest when practical results are considered. The women of Oregon will gain nothing by ratification before the next presidential election. They will have full franchise rights in any event, end quote. And again, quote, it would seem that having waited so long for suffrage, it will do no harm to postpone ratification, end quote. The entire country had conceded to the West the leadership in the movement for women's suffrage and expected that the generosity shown by Western men in extending the suffrage within their own states would be applied to the campaign to gain suffrage for the women of the nation. Their failure to do what was expected was a vast disappointment. 
in order to arouse western governors to an understanding of the national aspects of the question the national suffrage association now organized an appeal from the states which had ratified this petition was signed by the presidents of the national association's state auxiliaries the members of the national republican and democratic committees the chairman of the state republican and democratic committees and the official women representatives of the two parties they were forwarded to the governors of twelve states arizona california colorado idaho nevada new mexico north dakota oklahoma oregon south dakota washington and wyoming with a special letter of entreaty from the national suffrage association which read in part quote, we are well aware that the lives of all governors of state in these times of unrest and reconstruction are overwhelmingly full of duties and problems. It is not unlikely on this account that you may not have kept pace with the progress of the women's suffrage movement in war-torn Europe. I beg, therefore, to call your attention to the fact that all the allied countries of Europe have now not only granted the suffrage, but the women have actually exercised the right with the exception of France, Portugal, Montenegro, and Greece. The last of these to extend the the suffrage to women was Serbia. The Italian House of Deputies has passed the measure and the Italian women assure us that the Senate will do so soon. All the enemy countries, with the exception of Turkey and Bulgaria, have extended the suffrage to women. All the neutral countries of Europe, except Spain and Switzerland, have now extended the vote to women, the last of these being Luxembourg, Holland, and Sweden. The suffrage for women in most of these countries has come as an act of revolution, or as in Serbia, as you case from the government. Meanwhile, Rhodesia and British East Africa, whose governments stand in comparison to the self-governing colonies of Great Britain much as the territories do to our own government, have extended suffrage to their women. In the face of these amazing developments, it comes as a very depressing humiliation to American women that the heavy, slow-moving machinery of our democracy has delayed so long this simple act of democratic justice. It doubtless is impossible for you, who have lived all your life in a state where women have had equal suffrage with men, and where no comment is made upon the fact, to realize the feeling of hundreds of thousands of American women who have borne the brunt of the struggle in this country for their own enfranchisement. Women have lived long lives and have died in advanced years, and yet have given their very all during their lifetime to this struggle. Women still living look backward over more than a generation of continued service of education and pleading with the political parties of this country to do them justice. Now these women look across the ocean and see this act of democratic justice achieved as one of the results of the Great World War, while we, in this country, are still questioning as to whether there may be some political advantage gained or lost by one party or the other. I do beg of you, in honor of our nation, in respect to the history which is now being made the world around, to see that your state makes its contribution of ratification in such time that posterity will not blush at the hesitancy of our country to put this amendment into the Constitution. End of letter. Later in the month, to set forth the fact that special sessions were absolutely necessary in every Western state and to get renewed confirmation of the pledges made and make clear to Western governors that their hesitation was being interpreted throughout the country to mean opposition to the federal suffrage amendment, the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association went on a Western tour. Her schedule included 16 conferences in 12 states with Wake Up America as the keynote of each and an appeal to each state to be the one to ratify. Calls for special sessions followed quickly in California, North Dakota, Colorado, Oregon, and Nevada. For weeks, the attention of the entire country had been focused on California, the largest and most influential Western state which had gained women's suffrage during the last ten years. William D. Stevens was governor, a man who had gained prominence as a suffrage advocate in 1910, when the issue was in doubt and other political leaders refused to speak. Late in October, he sent the following telegram to seven Western governors, quote, we can perform a worthy and effective act if the far western governors and legislatures will present to the women of the West and of the nation a thanksgiving present by ratifying the amendment. I am asking the governors of Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Wyoming, Oregon, and Washington to join me in a group calling extra sessions before November 27, 1919. Will you call if the others will do so? End quote. Colorado and Nevada returned favorable replies. Oregon was not heard from, 
Governors Carey of Wyoming and Campbell of Arizona, Lazarola of New Mexico, and Hart of Washington, gave reasons why to them a special session was not advisable, the latter saying, quote, I have no power to limit the duration of a special session, and doubt the wisdom, therefore, unless the necessity clearly appears, end quote. Nothing daunted, a week later, Governor Stevens sent telegrams to governors of 14 Middle West and Eastern states saying, California, Colorado, and Nevada will have special sessions in November. Other Western states may also call. Will you not join with us to hasten the day that will give our nation the benefit of the vote of its women citizens? We realize how greatly the voting of the women has benefited California. We believe it will be of like value in the nation. I earnestly ask your cooperation. California's special session was called for November 1st, quote, for the exclusive consideration of the federal amendment, end quote. Five minutes after the resolution was read in the Senate, it was adopted. In the House, only two men voted against it, Carlton W. Green of San Luis Obispo and Robert Madison of Sonoma, the former because of the color question and the latter on account of, quote, the expense of an unnecessary call for which we gain nothing, end quote. In Maine, almost insuperable obstacles were overcome before a special session could be called. There had been only six special sessions since Maine became a state in 1820. The women's suffrage amendment had been defeated in 1917 by a vote of two to one. The state Supreme Court had unanimously decided that the presidential suffrage given by legislative enactment of 1918 must be referred to the voters and the governor had sent out a proclamation for the vote to be taken September 13, 1920. Note. Although the federal suffrage amendment was proclaimed as adopted on August 26, 1920, there was no way in which the main referendum on presidential suffrage could be legally omitted from the ballot. Therefore, Maine women, possessed by then of full suffrage, went to the polls on September 13, 1920, and voted on this partial suffrage state measure. The official count showed eyes 88,080, nays 30,462. Maine women's answer to the question, do women want to vote? End of note. Although the state Republican convention had gone on record in March for immediate ratification of the federal suffrage amendment, there was much opposition to action until after the result of the vote on presidential suffrage had been determined. In October, it became apparent that other matters needed legislative action, and Governor Carl E. Milliken issued the call for November 4. Thereupon, the Men's Anti-Suffrage Committee of Maine circularized the legislature in an effort to prevent action. They were amazed, quote, that ratification should be considered while a referendum on presidential suffrage was pending, end quote, and asked whether or not the law of this state is to be respected, end quote. The Kennebec Journal replied in part, quote, We apprehend that the attempt of our anti-suffrage friends to suspend the functions of and dictate to the constitutional tribunal entrusted with the power and duty of settling this great question will not be taken very seriously. The world moves, and Maine will move with it. End quote. Maine moved. Both houses ratified on November 5th, but in the House there were only three votes to spare. In December, it seemed necessary to call upon the political parties to speed up again the campaign for ratification. Before the passage of the federal suffrage amendment, there had been decided opposition to suffrage action within the ranks of both major parties. After the passage, each was determined that if women's suffrage had to come, the other should not have the credit for it. Both parties had maneuvered against each other on this question for many years, and the finish of the ratification campaign found them still maneuvering. At the urgent request of the National Suffrage Association, both Republican and Democratic national committees passed resolutions recommending that special sessions be held in order that women might be assured a vote in the early spring primaries. Three ratifications followed in December, those of North Dakota, South Dakota, and Colorado. In North Dakota, the chances of ratification were for a time imperiled because the dominant party, the Nonpartisan League, could not forget that North Dakota women, with their school suffrage, had elected to the superintendency of public instruction the only nominee who was not a league candidate. However, 
The suffragists were so successful in pleading the abstract justice of their cause that Governor Fraser called a special session for November 25th. Both House and Senate approved the ratification resolution. South Dakota's case was unusual. The state had had only two special sessions in 30 years. Governor Peter Norbeck, who intended to call a special session in 1920, did not feel justified in calling one in 1919 also. The conditions under which he was willing to act were that 51% of the South Dakota legislators should agree to attend the session at their own expense and without the usual per diem, promise not to vote for reimbursement at the session, act only on ratification, and that favorably. The women must secure the pledges. This was an enormous task, but the women undertook it. Answers to their poll were slowly coming in when the president of the South Dakota Auxiliary of the National American Women's Suffrage Association discovered a better way. The Richards Primary Law, carried November 1919, provided that on the second Tuesday in December, so-called proposal men, representing the parties in the various counties, should meet at the state capitol to prepare platforms and to propose candidates to be voted on at the March primaries. The public announcement indicated that many legislators would act as proposal men. The Republican, Democratic, and nonpartisan conventions were also called on that date. The suffragists recognized this as a psychological moment when almost the whole legislature would be on hand in Pierre, and readily obtained the consent of the governor to call a special session if it could be done with no expense to the state. The suffragists then interviewed legislators and entreated them to go to Pierre at their own expense. Pledges to do this were signed by a majority, and to comply with the three-day time limit, the call was issued on Saturday, November 30th at 3 o'clock for Tuesday, December 3rd at 7 p.m. For 36 hours, telegraph and telephone lines hummed as the effort was made to reach legislators in the remotest parts of the state. The snow was heavy, the roads almost impossible, but the men came from all directions. One legislator used up three automobiles, getting to the train from his home, many miles from the railroad, while another rushed from Minneapolis to Huron, called to his wife to send his grip, and just caught the train for Pierre. South Dakota had a unique ratification. It was the only state to hold a midnight special session and ratify between supper and breakfast. In Colorado, as in so many other states, the question of the expense of an extra session was paramount. Colorado women did not intend that this should serve as an excuse for failure to ratify. The Colorado Auxiliary of the National American Women's Suffrage Association told Governor Oliver H. Shoup that if he would call an extra session, their members would furnish all the necessary clerks and pages. The governor replied that unless the suffragists would raise $15,000 for the entire expense of the extra session, it would not be called. However, as in other states, reluctance was overcome by continued agitation and the discovery that the cost of special sessions was not so exorbitant. The governor finally called the session for December 8th. The resolution passed, both houses unanimously, having been introduced in the Senate by Senator Agnes Riddle. Six months had gone by since the submission of the federal suffrage amendment, and 22 states had ratified. The inevitable legal tests now began. End of chapter 23, read by Sandra. Chapter 24 of Woman, Suffrage, and Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Woman, Suffrage, and Politics, The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler. Chapter 24. The Legal Tests Begin. With the era of state referenda left behind, with the fight for the submission of the federal suffrage amendment by the Congress triumphantly finished, with the ratifications of 22 states already to the amendment's credit, and with the women of a majority of the states qualified to vote for the next president, ratification or no ratification, it might have seemed to the unwary that the rest of the suffrage struggle would be easy but nothing in connection with the suffrage struggle was ever allowed to be easy. In that auspicious appearing autumn of 1919, two of the most menacing hazards of all suffrage history lay just ahead. One, 
the legal test to which the constitutionality of both the suffrage and the prohibition amendments was to be subjected. The other, the determination of the opposition to prevent the 36th ratification. It was not 22 ratifications, nor 30, nor 35 that that opposition feared. It was exactly 36. Toward these hazards, the suffrage struggle now moved irresistibly. By election day, November 4th, 1919, both the prohibition and the suffrage amendments were deep in the maelstrom of legal contention which awaits all controversial legislation. Law in the United States is exceedingly elaborate, consisting of a federal and 48 state constitutions, and a federal and 48 codes of statutory law. The most accomplished of legal minds is incapable of holding the details of so diversified a system, and the laity, prone to confuse statutory and constitutional provisions, simply dismisses the whole subject of law as quite beyond the realm of comprehension. To make the entire system one constructive whole, every state law must be in agreement with the federal constitution, which is the supreme law of the land. Inconsistencies between newly made laws and constitutions of state or nation are not infrequently discovered, and, upon suitable action being brought, the courts declare such laws nullified because of their unconstitutionality. Opponents of disputed measures usually transfer their activities from legislative halls to courts as soon as the law they oppose has been passed by a legislature or the Congress, anticipating that what has been done by the will of the people may be undone on the strength of some neglect or loose construction of legal procedure, until they have set their lawyers to make a thorough search for unconstitutionalities, and brought to the courts any flaw they allege has been discovered, no campaign on any issue is considered at an end. As any law to be tested proceeds upon its snail-like course from minor to higher court, from higher court to state supreme court, and thence to the federal supreme court, its path is frequently obscured in the fog of contention, and long before its final destiny is determined, the fact that an action has been begun has been forgotten by the masses of the people who were interested at the beginning. Only those who have endured it can comprehend the agony of uncertainty which is the portion of friends and foes of every measure during the law's delay. Before the suffrage amendment had been submitted to the legislatures by the Congress, a group of prominent lawyers had been for some time engaged in a study of the possibilities of invalidating the Prohibition Amendment. Among them was the well-known Elihu Root, accounted one of the ablest constitutional lawyers in the United States. Although many suggested loopholes, through which the nation might hope to escape from its dry fate, were used as a basis for legal tests, only one of the methods of attack upon the 18th Amendment affected the 19th. This method was one which, in the early months of the agitation, brought out widespread differences of legal opinions, with eminent lawyers arrayed upon both sides. It sought an affirmative answer to the following question. Can a federal amendment be referred to the voters of a state after ratification by the legislature under state initiative and referendum laws? 22 states had such laws. The initiative and referendum was an undreamt-of procedure when the federal constitution was written, and since its introduction, its application to federal legislation had never been tested. It became the point around which, for several months, the hopes of anti-prohibitionists and anti-suffragists mounted with comforting anticipation and likewise the point which presented to prohibitionists and suffragists the most gloomy uncertainty. The suffrage amendment had three distinct advantages over the prohibition amendment, and one important disadvantage. The advantages were, one, a time limit of seven years for ratification had been fixed by the Congress for the prohibition amendment. No limit was attached to the suffrage amendment. Two, the prohibition amendment treated of absolutely new matter, and consequently, every phrase invited legal examination and interpretation concerning its agreement with other parts of the federal constitution. A considerable number of the legal attacks made against that amendment were based upon claims that inconsistencies existed. The suffrage amendment had been drawn in the exact form of the 15th Amendment, which had been held to be constitutional against every possible mode of attack. Three, 
The liquor forces threatened a referendum by petition in at least 18 of the referendum states on the Prohibition Amendment. 12 of the 22 initiative and referendum states were full suffrage states, and woman suffrage had passed so far beyond the controversial stage as to render a proposal for a referendum improbable in any of them. Two other initiative and referendum states, Louisiana and Mississippi, were certain to reject the amendment in any event, thus leaving eight states only where there was any likelihood of a referendum, should the federal Supreme Court declare state laws applicable to federal amendments. On the other hand, these three advantages were offset by, first, the certainty that nine states of the far south, in obedience to tradition concerning the Negro vote, would reject the amendment, thus leaving 39 states only from which to draw the necessary 36 ratifications. Second, suffrage referenda were already scheduled in three states for 1920. If the courts held that a state had the right to dispose of a federal amendment by referendum instead of by action of the legislature, ratification in the three states was sure to be postponed for the referenda. That meant until after the presidential election. And should the referenda result adversely, the suffrage struggle might be indefinitely prolonged. The liquor forces repeatedly announced through the press that they intended to defeat prohibition on referenda in 10 states if possible, thus reducing the total number of states ratifying prohibition below 36. Failing to achieve this expectation, they relied upon other legal action either to invalidate the amendment or at least to keep the question pending in the courts beyond the seven years limit. In support of this program, they had either filed petitions on the Prohibition Amendment in 18 states or publicly advertised their intention of so doing. Two state Supreme Courts, Ohio with one dissenting judge and Washington with four dissenting judges, had declared such referenda constitutional. Two state Supreme Courts, Maine and Oregon, had unanimously declared them unconstitutional. Under the Ohio decision and pending action by the federal Supreme Court, a referendum had actually been held on the ratification of the Prohibition Amendment, and the Wets had won. Cases were pending in the Supreme Courts of Nebraska, New Mexico, Michigan, Colorado, California, and Arkansas, and were on their way to state Supreme Courts in others. The opponents of both amendments were issuing widely published statements to the effect that ratification was not reflecting the will of the people. In consequence, not a little importance attached to the result of the Ohio election, as it seemed to furnish a practical illustration of the truth of their claim. The anti-suffragists announced anew that their plan was to defeat ratification of the suffrage amendment in 13 states and suffragists in private councils always conceded nine such rejections, and to secure a proclamation of defeat. Although certain opinions rendered in connection with the 14th and 15th Amendments by the Secretary of State have lent weight to the theory that no proclamation of defeat can be promulgated, the fact remains that the Supreme Court, which is the sole authority to decide questions of that import, has had no occasion to express itself on this still undecided point. In support of this program of the Antis, two states had rejected the amendment, and the eleven which would follow were confidently named. A petition for a referendum had been filed in Ohio on ratification of the suffrage amendment and also on presidential suffrage. Petitions were announced as in circulation in Missouri, Nebraska, and Massachusetts. Other referenda were threatened should 36 states ratify. A referendum petition had been filed on presidential suffrage in Maine, and the state Supreme Court, which had declared a referendum on ratification of prohibition illegal, had declared such a referendum legal on presidential suffrage. As the authority for presidential suffrage was drawn from the federal constitution, this decision would probably have been overturned had the case gone up to the federal Supreme Court. It happened that the governor had signed the bill in each state where this privilege had been extended to women, a fact that gave the general impression that it was distinctly a state measure. An attack had been made upon the validity of a woman's primary law in Texas, and it had been upheld in the lower courts. The state of legal confusion was now sufficiently perplexing to make it of use for campaign purposes. 
suffrage opponents promptly organized a drive upon national and state Republican and Democratic Party committee men with the purpose of convincing the leaders that the suffrage amendment was caught in such a tangle of legal uncertainty and of threatened referenda that further efforts to secure ratification before the presidential election would be futile. As the Republican Party was in control of the majority of the legislatures that were expected to take action, the campaign was more forcefully aimed at the leaders of that party. The group of Eastern Senators, who had for so many years prevented the submission of the federal suffrage amendment, and who were as obdurate if less publicly outspoken opponents as ever, listened to the anti-pleas and with fresh courage took up the appeals for delay. A public and private effort was made to persuade contributors to Republican campaign funds to make their gifts contingent upon promises quietly to withdraw the party from the ratification campaign. Whether these efforts met with any success, only those in private charge of Republican affairs knew, and they made no public confessions. Women anti-suffragists, as callers at the National Republican Headquarters, became an insistent and daily feature. Constant official announcements, widely published by the newspapers of the country, were issued by the opponents to the effect that woman suffrage in 1920 was impossible. If ratification could not be completed in time for women to vote in 1920, why disturb the even tenor of state politics by calling unnecessary special sessions, they asked, this question was put in every conceivable form by the official publicity issued by the opponents and was revamped and put forth editorially by every state paper which for reasons of its own opposed a special session of its state legislature. This campaign began to tell. National party leaders began to betray a coolness in noticeable contrast to the warmth of their cooperation at an earlier period. When people do not know what to think, they pause. With a state press warning the public that action by the state would be useless, many state suffragists caught the general alarm and relaxed their efforts to secure early action. The success of the campaign in the suffrage states was particularly perplexing. In most of them, not an active opponent of woman suffrage could be found, and none objected to ratification. Yet press and public, while denouncing anti-suffragists, picked up the excuses found on legal ground as put forth by them to get delay and joined in forwarding their argument. Governors felt the effect of the gradual lessening of the demand for special sessions and began to return evasive replies to plain questions. All along the line of campaign, a disconcerting hesitation made itself manifest. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of Women's Suffrage and Politics」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christina Ordonez – Women's Suffrage and Politics – The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Cadd and Eddie Roger Schuller Chapter 25 – Adding Up the Ramification Column The year 1920 opened with the National Suffrage Association wrestling with a difficult problem in arithmetic. 22 states have ratified, three more, Rhode Island, Kentucky, and New Jersey, were expected to ratify regular sessions, and the governors of eight more, Oregon, Wyoming, Indiana, Nevada, Idaho, Arizona, New Mexico, and West Virginia had promised special sessions in order to ratify, but 22 and 3 and 8 to do not make 36. It was believed that the two enfranchised states of Washington and Oklahoma would not hold out against the appeal of their parties for special sessions, when so many states should have been won that only the mysterious unknown 36 must be found. But 22 and 3 and 8 and 2 do not make 36. The governors of Vermont and Connecticut, both anti-suffragists but with legislatures favorable to suffrage, might succumb to party appeal and thus bring the last state without a battle. If their hostility should continue, there was still Delaware to offer hope of completing the sum and suffrage edition. On the other hand, there was the possible Supreme Court decision which might make state referendum laws apply to federal amendments, in which case ratification by November 1920 would undoubtedly be prevented. With this very object in view, the fight of the wet forces was still going on. The president of the National Association opposed to women's suffrage sent frequent wires to the governors, 
one of a tread, in behalf of this organization of women determined to uphold the Constitution of the United States and federal principle embodied in states' rights doctrines upon which our government rests, I express profound respect to you for withstanding the pressure to which suffrage leaders boldly proclaim they are subjugating you and to which they boast you must eventually exceed. We infer, you understand, that ratification cannot stand the legal tests bound to ensue in the courts, and that these cases, should ratification be obtained in time for women to vote this year, would hold up the election result and throw the country into political chaos, possibly necessitating a second election. In the meantime, to show that the predictions of political chaos were not taken too seriously, five states ratified in rapid succession in January, Rhode Island, Kentucky, Oregon, Indiana, and Wyoming. In Rhode Island, the state auxiliary of the National American Woman Suffrage Association had asked for a special session as soon as the federal amendment was submitted. Governor R. Livingston Beekman objected to a special session because of expense and because other issues might be presented, but he agreed to do as Republican leaders of the state should decide. On June 27, 1919, these leaders had met in Providence and by an overwhelming majority had voted to recommend to the governor that no session be held. The governor had then issued a statement containing the following. The calling of a special session is a power that should be used in a most careful manner and only at a time of grave necessity. Within the short period of six months, the resolution will come before the General Assembly in regular session, and I believe there is no public necessity of calling a special session at this time, or that the cause of woman's suffrage will be in any way delayed or hindered by this course. Personally, I am earnestly in favor of ratification. By coming out for early action, two influential Rhode Island Republicans, Colonel Colt and ex-Senator Lippitt, threw consternation into the ranks of the leaders. Moreover, to remove the governor's objections, the Providence Journal twice offered, in writing, to defray the expenses of an extra session, while the Democratic State Central Committee agreed not to press the property qualification for voters and the soldier's bonus if the session were held. Through July and August of 1919, suffragists had worked on the state indefatigably. Interviews were held with the governor, and the governor in turn had conferences with the Republican State Central Committee, all apparently to no purpose. On September 29th, 70 women, representing various state organizations, visited the governor. While admitting that offers had been made to meet his two objections, he professed not to see any difference between an early session and one in January. By this time, women all over the country had become suspicious of the good intent of the major parties to put ratification through quickly, and in none of the states more so than in Rhode Island. Rhode Island papers began to discuss the hidden forces that were lined up against ratification. The good faith of Mr. Will Hayes, chairman of the National Republican Organization, was impugned by the Providence Papers. Women in the political organizations were warned editorially to be on guard against putting party before principle if they wanted suffrage to win. At all events, there was no special session in Rhode Island, and the date of the regular session, January 6th, found the woman keyed up to hard press for ratification on the first day, lest there be some contretemps. When Senate and House came together to receive the governor's message on that first day, he said to them, I unqualifiedly approve the ratification of this amendment and urge that it be accomplished without a day's delay. One of three dissenting votes in the House was cast by the Speaker, Han Arthur P. Sumner, a lifelong enemy of woman suffrage who asked the privilege of casting the first vote against. In the Senate, Lieutenant Governor Emery J. Sanssouci, a friend of suffrage, was in the chair and within a few moments, with no speeches and only one vote against, that of John H. McCabe, Democrat of Barillaville, ratification was accomplished. Few knew that when the measure was submitted to the Senate, only a last-minute compromise prevented its going to committee overnight. Fifteen senators were bent on delaying action for a day in order to show the governor that the Senate was not a rubber stamp for his office. Such petty jealousies of authority had crippled the giving of suffrage from the beginning and would cripple it to the end. In the Rhode Island case, fortunately, the leader of the insurgents gave up his plans and voted with others under suspension of rules. In Kentucky, the president of the state auxiliary of the National Suffrage Association had polled members of the legislature at the time that they were up for election, 
and enough favorable replies had been then received to ensure ratification. As early as June 6, Governor James T. Black publicly stated that he would not call a special session. He did not change his mind. September 3rd, the Democratic State Convention met in Louisville. It had been rumored that an effort would be made to ignore the amendment and substitute a plank favoring a state referendum. President Wilson sent the following telegram, Both as the leader of the party and as a student of existing conditions throughout the world, I venture to urge with the utmost earnestness that the state convention include in its platform a plank in favor of the suffrage amendment. It would serve mankind and the party by doing so. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, later candidate for President of the United States, wrote to Senator W. A. Perry of Louisville, earnestly urging early favorable action on the ratification resolution. The only fight in the adoption of the entire platform was whether to call on the coming legislature to ratify the federal suffrage amendment or to submit suffrage to a state referendum. As finally passed the plank read, We favor the ratification by the legislature of Kentucky at its next session of the amendment to the Constitution of the United States, extending to women this right of suffrage, and we urge our representatives in the legislature of Kentucky and all executive or other officers to use their votes and influence in every legitimate way to bring about the ratification of same. We pledge ourselves to support in the next General Assembly, if the federal amendment has not become operative by that time, the submission of an amendment to the state constitution granting suffrage to women on the same terms as to men and when the amendment is submitted to support it at the polls as a party measure. Ratification was completed January 6, 1920, during the regular session of the legislature. There was little debate in the lower house, but Senate action was delayed until a proposition to submit the question of ratification to a statewide referendum was rejected. In Oregon, from June to September of 1919, letters from legislators, organizations, and individuals flowed into Governor Ben W. Alcott's office to urge a special session which he persistently refused to call. It was on July 25th that the governor named the conditions under which he would call a session as follows. In offering to call a special session in the event that a majority of members of both houses request it, and with the understanding that they pay their own expenses, I am taking into consideration the fact that the matter of ratification is one lying solely within the province of the legislature. The executive officers have power neither to veto nor approve a resolution of ratification. For this reason, I feel if a majority of the members wish that they should be given an early opportunity to act upon the question, but in doing so, they must act at their own expense and not at the expense of the state. And, he added, no other legislation must be considered with these terms, which no other governor had yet imposed. Ratification meant more serious difficulties in Oregon, a full suffrage state, than those presented by any other state. The excuse of the expense did not seem valid, as the legislators were paid only $3 a day in mileage, the entire cost would be within $5,000. Members of the Oregon Auxiliary of the National American Women's Suffrage Association promptly agreed to raise $6,000 and proceeded with the role of the legislators according to the governor's demands. That they did not secure the required number of pledges was due to the fact that members resented the governor's requirements to pay their own expenses and not take up other legislation. Miss Alexander Thompson, the only woman member of the legislature, wrote the governor at once, offering to waive her per diem in expenses, pointed out that if the Western governors continued to say that they would call a special session if needed to complete ratification, no headway would be made, and concluded, by a prompt action on your part, we will help to inspire other states and pave the way for the settlement of this question. The governor's answer was an announcement in the press that he would call an extra session at state expense when and if Oregon was needed to make 36 ratifications. On November 5th, the president of the National Suffrage Association, who was making a Western trip in the interest of ratification, speaking at the Molnoma Hotel, Portland, with reference to Action Oregon, said, One of the unfortunate things about our 48 states is the fact that each is so ignorant and so uninterested in the problems of each other. The effect of your indifference is this. Our people are saying, these Western women don't care anything about the vote or they would see that we get it too. Do you see the responsibility? I don't blame your governor who says there is no demand. I ask you to create this demand, not boisterously, not bitterly, 
Don't try to force a special session, but find out why he objects, and then meet conditions. If he doesn't want other legislation, then let legislators confer with him. Following this meeting, a special committee interviewed the governor, appealing for a special session on the ground that they wanted women of non-suffrage states to receive whatever moral support there might be in early ratification. It was just after this call on the governor that there developed other and more important reasons for calling a session than to approve the suffrage amendment. The provisions of the Roosevelt Highway Bill, as it had passed the previous state legislature, were in conflict with those of the Government Road Aid Bill. With this discovery, newspapers urged senators and representatives to use their influence to induce the governor to call the session, which he finally did for January 12, 1920. Within 20 minutes from the time the two branches met, each had adopted unanimously a joint resolution to ratify the suffrage amendment. When Governor James P. Goodrich of Indiana was importuned to call a special session early in June of 1919 by members of the Indiana Auxiliary of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, he replied that if 35 other states would call their legislatures, he would do so. He submitted a plan to the president of the National Suffrage Association, which she approved, and on June 13th, he wired the governors of 31 states as follows. The sentiment here is for the ratification, but before deciding upon the advisability of calling the Indiana legislature, I am anxious to obtain the sentiment of other states whose legislatures do not meet in ordinary session this year. Are you willing to call a special session of your General Assembly in the event that a sufficient number of other states decide to take the same action in order to ensure early ratification? On June 28th, the governor wrote Indiana legislators regarding a special session for the first week in September and asked whether by proper resolution or by general agreement action could be limited to matters contained in the call. Uneasiness immediately began to manifest itself among state officials and Republican leaders. They feared efforts would be made to amend or repeal the new tax law, that other questions would be injected, that it might be difficult for the Republicans to organize satisfactorily since half a dozen candidates for Speaker of the House had appeared, and so on. No public statement followed as the result of the governor's correspondence and when, July 30th, it was found that he had postponed the call indefinitely, suffragists in turn became uneasy and then indignant. To all demands, he replied, there is no need for a session at this time. Further than that, I have nothing to say. Women all over the state held indignation meetings and the governor was deluged with protests from all kinds of Indiana organizations. July melted into August. August had been replaced by September, and in turn by October, November, and December. Still, no action. On December 30th, the governor gave a plan to the officers of the Indiana Auxiliary of the National Suffrage Association. It was... If the woman could pledge two-thirds of the members of both houses to come for a day and to consider nothing but ratification, he would call the session. Public sentiment was tremendously aroused over the governor's proposal, and press and people commented freely and often fiercely on it. Yet, what was demanded, the woman did, and on January 13, 1920, they presented to the governor written pledges from 36 senators and 70 representatives, and the session was called for January 16th. The Senate and House met that day in joint session to hear the governor's message. In the Senate, action was delayed for two or three hours by the final wails of three aunties, Oliver Klein, Huntington, Charles A. Hagerty, South Bend, and Franklin McGray, Indianapolis. The vote silenced them. As soon as the House passed the resolution, a waiting band struck up. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Robert D. Carey, governor of Wyoming, pulled the legislature himself for a voluntary session, although no one but suffrage leaders knew that it was being done and that on the result depended the call. The session was held January 26, and the vote was unanimous in both houses. When the envoy sent by the National American Suffrage Association had called upon Governor Emmett D. Boyle of Nevada, they had found him opposed to a special session because of expense. One of the envoys suggested the plan which was afterwards put into effect of securing the consent of the entire legislature that only a quorum of members from nearby communities should be assembled to consider ratification only, the woman to serve as clerks. The governor agreed to write the members and assured the woman that if the one-day plan was not feasible, another one would be mean. Again at a meeting held in Reno in November 1919, 
attended by the president of the National Suffrage Association, the governor publicly announced that he would call a session. Finally, the call was issued and the legislature met February 7, 1920, after an agreement to which the women were a party that the cost was not to exceed $1,000. To meet the expense, the women of Carson City arranged to give legislators free room and board during the session. In his message to the legislature, the governor said, While no certainty exists, the favorable action of Nevada will in 1920 assure to the women of the United States the same voting privileges which our women enjoy by virtue of our state law. It does appear certain that without our favorable action, the cause of national suffrage may be delayed for such a time as to withhold the right to vote at a presidential election for millions of the women of America. In the Senate, the vote was unanimous. In the House, Miss Hurst, the one woman member, introduced the resolution to ratify and presided during roll call. Representative W. O. Ferguson cast the one vote against announcing that he was opposed to having the people of Nevada tell the women of the Union whether or not they should vote. By the hardest sort of addition, the ratification column now floated up 28, and only 28. End of chapter 25. Recording by Christina Ordonez, Claremont, Florida. Chapter 26 of Women's Suffrage and Politics this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Woman Suffrage and Politics, The Inner Story of the Suffrage Movement by Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler. Last of All Suffrage Conventions. With February of 1920, the suffrage program reached its interorganizational climax. The annual suffrage convention scheduled for Chicago, February 12th through the 18th. Not only was this to be the last of all suffrage conventions, far and wide it had been heralded as the victory convention. Although the end of the suffrage struggle had not yet come, everybody felt sure it would come in 1920, and the National American Woman Suffrage Association was forehanded enough to go part way to meet the final victory. Far from sidetracking the ratification campaign to make way for convention activities, those activities were but used to point and push the campaign. Suffragists hear this last call to a suffrage convention. So read the call that was to assemble the suffrage hosts. Of all the conventions held within the past 51 years, this will prove the most momentous. Few people live to see the actual and final realization of hopes to which they have devoted their lives. That privilege is ours. Let us tell the world of the ever buoyant hope born of the assurance of justice and the inevitability of our cause, which has given our army of workers unswerving courage and determination, which has at last overcome every obstacle and attained its aim. From Maine and from Florida, from California and from Texas, and from all the states between, the women streamed into Chicago in the wintry February weather. The city, the whole country was ice-locked and snow-banked. But spring was in the hearts of the suffragists. Never where women had come together had there been a gathering so gay, and never one so feelingly motivated by the sense of solidarity that holds organizations together. Hand clasps seemed to mean more that February than they had ever meant before. Women looked into each other's eyes and saw old, endearing memories of long, hard work together leap to life. They were facing new things, new affiliations, separate ways, but the recognition of what the old things, the old supreme affiliation, the old way together had done for them, singly and collectively, rested on them with a poignant inner compulsion. They could not shake it off. It dominated their merrymaking. It made them stop one another in corridors and in corners to whisper, to think that we shall not meet again like this, not next year, not ever. Ours has been a movement with the soul, said the president of the Suffrage Association to the assembled delegates, a dauntless, unconquerable soul ever leading on. Women came, served, and passed on, but others came to take their places, while the same great soul was ever marching 
on through a hundred, nay, a thousand years, a soul immortal, directing, leading the woman's crusade for the liberation of the mothers of the race. That soul is here today, and who shall say that all the hosts of the millions of women who have toiled and hoped and met delay are not here today, and joining in the rejoicing that their cause has at last won its triumph. Oh, how do I pity the women who have had no share in the exultation and the discipline of our army of workers. How do I pity those who have felt none of the grip of the oneness of women struggling, serving, suffering, sacrificing for the righteousness of woman's emancipation. Be glad today. Let your voices ring out the gladness in your hearts. There will never come another day like this. Let your joy be unconfined and let it speak so clearly that its echo will be heard around the world and find its way into the soul of every woman of any and every race and nationality who is yearning for opportunity and liberty still denied her sex. She closed with a parody on Kipling's poem, If, which read, We kept our heads when all about us were losing theirs and blaming it on us. We made allowance for the doubts of men and kept our faith, though they were scornful then. We were lied about, yet did not deal in lies. We were hated, yet did not give way to hating. We did not look too good, nor talk too wise. We waited and were not tired by waiting. We heard the truths that we had spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, and watched the cause we'd given our life to broken, yet bravely built again with poor cheap tools. We held on when there was nothing in us except the will which says, hold on. Thus for sixty years marched on the suffrage soul and felt no doubt to reach the final goal. Thus filled we up each fleeting minute with sixty seconds worth of distance run. And now ours is the earth and everything that's in it. Rejoice, applaud, be glad, you've won. A ribbon attached to the clapper of a bell hung in the middle of the convention hall was pulled by a woman holding the other end of the ribbon. Other women with other ribbon ends pulled. The bell pealed forth. The woman's hour was striking. At the sound, old staid traditions were flung to the winds. Cheering and singing, delegation after delegation got to its feet and began marching. Women were sowing their political wild oats. They seemed suddenly to discover what men long since discovered, that the true purpose of a political convention is to make a noise. The high hall rang with their racket. For a long time it was a question whether they would ever be quiet again. While convention celebrations and festivities were mounting to high tide, there came, one by one, the announcement of ratifications in New Jersey, Idaho, Arizona, and New Mexico bringing the total number to 32. The Washington League of Women Voters wired, the women of Washington send greetings to the Victory Convention. We were a pioneer state, the fifth to be enfranchised. Therefore, we resent the disgraceful humiliation put upon us by the stubborn refusal of our governor to listen to our united demand for a special session to ratify the suffrage amendment. Immediately, a telegram was sent by the convention to Louis A. Hart, governor of the state, which read, Washington is now the only enfranchised state which has taken no action toward ratification of the federal suffrage amendment. 35 ratifications are assured in the immediate future. The nation has been informed for many years that Washington approves woman's suffrage. It therefore looks to you to call an immediate session of your legislature and once more announce Washington's endorsement of woman's suffrage by ratification of the federal amendment. Through the Associated Press, the telegram went to the newspapers of Washington. The governors of Connecticut, Vermont, Delaware, and West Virginia were also urged by wire to call sessions, and there was a lively exchange of telegrams with the ratification committees in these states. The convention ordered telegrams of thanks sent to the governors who had called special sessions and to the chairman of the national committees of the two dominant parties, Will H. Hayes, Republican, and Homer Cummings, Democrat, who had rendered continuous and able support to the campaign. Telegrams were also sent to governors who had not called special sessions urging the call.
A ratification banquet on St. Valentine's evening filled to overflowing the largest banquet hall in Chicago. Banquets had long been a feature of suffrage campaigning, but never had there been one to tell a story like this. High upon a balcony was a huge, old-fashioned valentine with lacy frills and a big red heart in the middle. Two little maids upon signal pulled back the red silk curtains, leaving a space large enough for a person to stand in and make a half-length portrait with the heart for a frame. Then in verse, the states which had ratified were introduced one by one, and a prominent state suffrage leader appeared in the frame, and in humorous verse told the story of the victory. There were salvos of applause and sudden bursts of state songs, as Illinois' gaily attired state delegation sprang upon chairs after the state story had been told by its living valentine. Tears of joyous happiness glistened in many an eye as incidents in the long struggle were brought to mind, or half forgotten memories awakened. Eloquent speeches thrilled, flags waved, cheers and unexpected bursts of song reverberated through the vast hall. Outstanding among the convention's features was a beautiful and solemn service in memory of Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, whose magic voice, now stilled forever, had been the inspiration of every previous convention for 30 years. The 100th anniversary of the birthday of Susan B. Anthony, greatest of all suffrage leaders, was especially commemorated by a program of brief speeches, which collectively told the whole wonderful story of the emancipation of women from 1840, the age of mobs and eggs, to 1920, a portent of victory. Another program told the suffrage story in pictures, another in a living procession of victories, a simple, beautiful, and effective pageant. At a pioneer's luncheon, the reminiscences of the workers of early days were told, and many a woman whose name was familiar to all suffragists, but whose face was unknown to later workers, was there to share in that last organized tribute. But in spite of such programs, the convention did not expend all its energies on looking backward, nor its time in enjoying the triumph of the moment. It carefully planned for every emergency in the uncompleted ratification campaign, and it affected the organization of the League of Women Voters with a new national board distinct from that of the Suffrage Association. To this new body, the National American Woman Suffrage Association's auxiliaries in all the ratified states were transferred by their representatives and a program of education and citizenship for new voters and legislation for the protection of women, children, and the home was adopted. Before the convention ended the phoenix of a new organization with fresh ideals, aims, and program had arisen from the old. Pronounced the most wonderful of all suffrage conventions during the 72 years of the struggle, the convention came to an end. The women who had worked side by side for a generation separated and went to their homes in the 48 states, some to throw themselves with ardor into political party organization work, some into the legislative program, some into citizenship education. But the National Suffrage Association's officers and the members of the association's auxiliaries in those states whose legislatures had not yet ratified the federal suffrage amendment, bent anew to the suffrage task. End of chapter 26